I now declare that the Plano City Council preliminary open meeting is reconvened into open session, that all council members are present. Our first item is uh, the preliminary agenda is consideration and action resulting in the executive session. Our next item is personnel appointments. First item is item A, Animal Shelter Advisory Committee, member and chair. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, for, Hold on, uh, Council Member. Let me go back up to uh, the, the ones we just did. Board of Adjustment, members and chair. They wanted me first, Rick. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Rick. <laughs> uh, Mayor and Council, we are going to uh, recall Janet Stovall as a regular appointee and make her chair again, uh, and also appoint Samuel Johnson, Dylan Rafferty, Douglas Shockey. Those will all be regulars, and the alternate will be Arthur Ellis Stone. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. We'll just do hand votes. All in favor? Motion passes. Thank you. Building Standards Commission, members and chair. Uh, Mayor, we would like to um, uh, appoint William Clay to the vacancy um, and appoint as alternates Daryl Bowen and Joseph Peicher. And uh, do we have to do the chair in a separate motion? I don't think so. No, 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 just no. Okay, and um, reappoint Peter Krause as chair. Second? Second. All right. I have a motion to second. <clears throat> I'm sorry. For Building Standards Commission, all in favor? Motion passes, 8 to 0. Heritage Commission chair? Mayor, we make a motion to appoint uh, Harry Ziegler as chair. There are no opening and vacant spots other than that. And second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second for the Heritage Commission Chair. All in favor? Motion passes 8 to 0. Planning and Zoning Commission, member and chair. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we make a motion to have David Downs as the chair and appoint John Michael Brunoff as the regular. Second. I have a motion and a second for Planning and Zoning Commission member and chair. All in favor? Motion passes, 8 to 0. On the DART Board of Directors, inter interim member, I nominate Nathan Barbera. I don't and have Mayor, there will actually be a resolution. Is yeah. that coming up? Mm -hmm. All right, so yep, we'll do, a we'll do that in a minute. Uh, item 2, Animal Shelter Advisory Committee, member and chair. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to appoint uh, Brenda Beard as the uh, new member for Animal Shelter, and we will uh, reappoint uh, the uh, existing chair, uh, Karen uh, Dubrow. Second. Thank you. I have a motion second for the member and chair of Animal Shelter. All in favor? Motion passes eight zero. Community Relations Commission Chair. I make a make a motion to reappoint Johnny Singh. Second. Uh, motion is second to uh, appoint Chair Johnny Singh in Community Relations. All in favor? Motion passes eight to zero. Uh, Cultural Arts Commission, member, interim member, and chair. Rita Cosgrove and Peter Wynn as members, uh, Peter Wynn being the interim appointment and the chair of the Cultural Arts Commission, Fabian Gordon. Second. Thank you. I have a motion uh, second for Community Relations Commission. No, excuse me, Cultural Arts Commission. All in favor? Motion passes eight to zero. Library Advisory Board Chair. Uh, Council Member Williams and I have conferred and we would like to reappoint Adam Griffith as the Chair of the Library Advisory Board. Second. 
I have a motion uh, for and a second for library advisory board. All in favor? Motion passes eight to zero. Plano Housing Authority. Uh, I'd like to appoint uh, James Duggan and Ron Johnson to the Plano Housing Authority Board. Second that motion. Thank you. I have a motion and second uh, for the Plano Housing Authority. All in favor? Motion passes eight to zero. I did, didn't I? Yep. Too bad. <laughs> Parks and Rec, sorry. Parks and Rec Planning Board members and chair. Mayor, um, uh, Councilman Riccadelli and I spoke. We currently have over, uh, nearly 50 applicants for the Park and Recreation, and so far we are able to agree on uh, Bob Kerr being appointed. We have not made, it, made a determination with regard to chair as well as two other appointments. So we would like to, at this time, make a motion to appoint Bob Kerr and then to have the other uh, three appointments table until the next meeting. Okay, all right. Second. Okay. Well said. So I have a motion <laughs> and a second to appoint Bob Kerr to Parks and Rec. All in favor? Motion passes. Retirement Security Plan Committee. Mayor and Council, I recommend uh, appointment of Susan Omen to the um, uh, Retirement Security Plan Committee and to continue with Karen Rhodes Whitley as the chair. Thank you. Motion to appoint Susan Omen and Karen Rhodes Whitley as chair. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and second uh, to appoint Retirement Security Plan Committee member and chair. All in favor? Motion passes. Item H, Senior Advisory Board. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we are going to um, appoint uh, and reappoint Carol Greisdorf as the chair um, and appoint to the uh, board as a motion, Grace Chavez, Deborah Weiner, and Patricia Ann Yarn Yon Yondell. Well done. Not so well. <laughs> <laughs> and that was great, I second. <laughs> Uh, motion and second to approve senior advisory board members and chair. All in favor? Motion passes, eight to zero. Uh, tax increment financing reinvestment zone number two and number three boards, chair. I make a motion to reappoint, reappoint Corey Reinecker as the chair. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to appoint. Uh, the tax increment financing reinvestment zone number two and three chair. All in favor? Thank you. Motion passes, eight to zero. And the tax increment financing reinvestment zone number four board, members and chair. Uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Prince and I would like to appoint uh, Catherine Casavant and Timothy Hill to the vacancies and reappoint Shep Stahl as chair. All right. Second. Thank you. I have a uh, motion and a second to uh, uh, approve tax increment financing reinvestment zone number four board members and chair. All in favor? Thank you. Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Our next item is a short-term rental presentation. Mark? Mayor and Council, we have Richard Abernathy um, with a, a, a consulting attorney that will be making the presentation uh, on behalf of the city. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Richard Abernathy. To my right is Ryan Pittman. We're uh, shareholders and directors at Abernathy Rotor Boyd and Hullett Law Firm. And we've been asked to provide you with an update uh, on what we believe to be the law for short-term rentals. The observation that um, we have gleaned from talking with your city attorney, who's been very helpful, and I think we're going to show a slide show uh, that was, I think, put together primarily by 
So you're going to put me in charge of this. Okay. This could be interesting. So ask us to put together, uh, they put together this program. We've looked at it. Uh, we agree with it. And we wanted to bring you to you tonight what we believe is the status of the law to assist you in the other things you're putting in the pot to decide what to do about short-term rentals. On a 10,000 foot level, it appears to me that in this city, like many other cities, uh, there are a number of different opinions. So on the one hand, you have owners of short-term rentals who believe legally that they're entitled uh, pursuant to statute and constitution to have little or no restrictions on short-term rentals. On the other hand, you have citizens uh, at various levels. Some maybe don't care, some want them banned, and some want excessive, a lot of regulation or some regulation. And sandwiched between those two viewpoints uh, is the city council who's being asked to do something about it. I make that comment because as I indicated a moment ago, you're gonna be making, I guess you'll be making some decisions. And one of the overriding things about this decision is uh, in some, the law is in flux. There are some things that are becoming reasonably well established. There are some that are in, may or may not occur. And there are some that at least for now are pretty well settled that you can't do. And so tonight I'm gonna to try to share with you that. We're gonna do it in uh, two, maybe three short reports. I'm gonna give you an overview. Ryan is gonna stand up and give you the um, law. And then I may return if I think it's helpful to give some kind of summary. If I don't need to, then I'm not gonna come back up and take any more of your time. So let's start. What are short-term rentals? Well, it's a lease of residential property for a period of less than 30 days. So overall, before I give you these three points, I wanna make a comment. Uh, as I just indicated, there are some actions that I think are reasonably uh, well established and that you can take. And we're gonna, do, we're gonna set these out in red, yellow, and green, kind of like a stop sign. The green says you can probably do it. The second level of cases we're gonna talk about and the actions you can take, some are simply uh, not authorized at all. That would be your red. Uh, and finally, there'll be some that uh, maybe you'll be able to do on some level, but uh, at this point, they're either in litigation or the outcome is unknown. What we do know, though, is that uh, the Texas courts have consistently rejected claims that STRs are commercial uses. If it were a commercial use in a residential area, you clearly could uh, ban that. At least one court decision noted that the outcome uh, in certain circumstances involving HOAs could be different if there was specific language to the contrary in HOA deed covenants. Ryan's going to go over those cases with you and give you some update on that. Finally, it appears from my perspective that the Attorney General has consistently sided with STR owners against cities in this litigation and they have intervened in several cases, which Ryan will bring to you later. So what types of concerns are citizens bringing to you? And based on our conversations with the city attorney's office, uh, noise, late nights, nuisance type things are being brought up. Uh, the, there's a lot of transit strangers that are com being complained about, overcrowding, a concern about reduction in property values, an increase in crime, uh, an increase in traffic, parking congestion, commercial business, and they can, then many of the uh, citizens contend that this is a commercial business in a residential neighborhood. They're concerned about the flavor and the integrity of the neighborhood or the neighbors that are, are in these, uh, that are living next to STRs and ultimately that affects the quality of life. Those are the kind of concerns that have been raised by citizens, there may be others. So starting with the green, what type of regulations have been considered legally defensible? The first is registration and licensing. You can require conditions such as safety guidelines, establish a point of contact, uh, 
this avoids creating special rules that only apply, you gotta avoid creating special rules that only apply to STRs. You need to apply them uh, for, to everyone. For example, a licensing regulation can't be used to revoke a license for a single noise complaint or implement unconstitutional conditions for issuance. But because you have nuisance uh, regulations and noise regulations, they'd be applied citywide and they certainly would be applicable to STRs. And the court of, uh, in the Fifth Circuit, which is the circuit that in federal courts that oversees and controls uh, Texas law, has held that there's no property right in a license renewable, distinguishable from property rights in like a home or land. So for example, if you did a registration, that registration could be subject to certain requirements to comply with various ordinances, such as your nuisance ordinance, your noise ordinance and the like. And if there's a certain number of violations, then potentially you'd be able to avoid reissuing a citation. Finally, any fine or fee for registration must be reasonable and not excessive, but you can charge one. Now we're gonna move from green to yellow. That is, it's not absolutely clear yet, at least from my perspective, of whether you can do these uh, without uh, significant legal risk. Zoning is one way that you may be able to affect uh, short-term rentals, but it would be, it, but the, the cases that are coming up the ones that are having the most traction are the ones that go through the standard zoning process. It's, for example, it's filed with the city, it's reviewed by P and Z, it's voted on, people have the right to come and make their comments and opinions about it, they have public hearings, and then it goes to the city council and you go through the same process, like a traditional zoning case. And then if a STR use exists in an area that later becomes restricted through zoning, the pre-existing uh, use should be allowed to continue to operate even after the restriction is implemented. It's known as grandfathering or a non-conforming use. These regulations are currently being contested by STR, owners of STRs uh, under constitutional claims. And that's been a primary focus of owners of STRs is constitutional claims such as takings, retroactivity claims, and due process claims, as well as equal protection claims. The city, uh, this is an area where you can regulate. Uh, the city has nuisance ordinances such as noise, occupancy limitations, assembly limitations, parking, crime, trash, traffic exceptions. You can apply those, but you can't focus it just on STRs. You need to apply the ordinance as it's written. It's applicable to the entire city for any circumstances in which a nuisance uh, is uh, created or there's a violation of the ordinance. The reason you do that is the courts have found that ordinances that restrict assembly rights, such as groups gathering on property at STRs are unconstitutional under the First Amendment. The courts have found no compelling interest to regulate STRs differently when data does not reflect a disproportionate issue with the STR use. In other words, it's on the same level play playing field as every other issue that might come up under a noise ordinance or a nuisance ordinance or whatever. So far, there have been regulations attempted by cities, other cities that have not been successful. And thus, from our perspective at this point, we think the law is that you should not be doing these or you're doing them at a very high risk. Obviously, courts of appeals make uh, mistakes. You can take them up to the Texas Supreme Court and litigate that, and maybe you'll turn it around, and maybe you won't. But currently, here's sort of what's going on uh, with regulations that have been attempted by other cities that have not been successful. Uh, and. Ryan's gonna go over the facts of these cases, so I'm just gonna highlight what the points are. One is restricting assembly at STR properties. For example, only a certain number of people can, can attend. Uh, occupancy limitations stricter for STRs and other residential uses have been struck down or routinely struck down. Limitations on group gatherings stricter for STR than others are being struck down. You see the 
the trend here is that you're discriminating against SDR. You're treating it differently than you are other uses. Uh, you're, you're running into some problems. Uh, that's the city of Austin case, which Ryan's going to speak about. Citywide bans of STRs, uh, at least in the grapevine case, uh, have been held to be unenforceable. Finally, sunset or phasing out STRs over time, which was an, uh, an effort by the city of Austin, uh, was not successful. Just recently, last month, I guess it was in August, not last month. In August, the Fifth Circuit in Texas said that owner occupancy, residency, homestead requirements for STRs are not allowed. So in that uh, case, the city of New Orleans had passed an ordinance that required that SDR, STRs had to be, could only be allowed under uh, owner occupied residences. Uh, the court said, the Fifth Circuit said that's not allowed. Now that could be overturned by the US Supreme Court, but right now that's the law of the land in the state of Texas. Relying upon current zoning definitions to prohibit short-term rentals or stating that a short-term rental use is prohibited by zoning because it's not an allowed land use is also not gathering much steam. So what we mean by this is you take an existing, so SDRs were not considered, were not in your minds when you pass your zoning ordinance. Then you take an existing definition regarding land uses in your zoning ordinance and you want to apply it to an STR. Well, it's been tried several times. The city of Grapevine case is an example that Ryan will go over. But in the cases that we've seen so far, those have not been successful. So I'm going to turn this over to Ryan now and allow him to give you more detail based upon his cases. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for having us. Um, Ryan Pittman on behalf of Abernathy Rotor, Boyd and Hullett. Uh, I'm going to provide some additional detail on the facts of the cases that Richard touched on previously um, and uh, provide some additional context to you to, uh, so that you understand the, the context in which those cases were decided. Ryan, yes. I just want to make it clear. <laughs> The, per the person in this litigation is not me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's a, very, it's a very rare name, and obviously it has to come up in the SDR. So anyway. You're absolutely right. I can confirm that, Mayor. You are not a litigant in that case. Um, the people who were litigants in that case against the Sea of Grapevine are a variety, are a group of uh, SDR owners and operators who brought a challenge against the city uh, this case was decided by the Fort Worth Court of Appeals. It's important to note that uh, the Fort Worth Court of Appeals is not, uh, ha does not have jurisdiction over Plano, uh, so it would not be a binding precedent on the city of Plano. Uh, the Dallas Court of Appeals is the court of appeals that does have jurisdiction over Plano. But uh, many courts of appeals in Texas look to other sister courts as, uh, in their decisions as being persuasive authority. Uh, so that would be important to point out. So in December 2021, the Fort Worth Court of Appeals decided this case. And the facts were as follows. The city adopted an ordinance in 2018 that sought to reaffirm the city's position that SCRs were uh, ad addressed in, both addressed in the existing 1982 adopted zoning ordinance and in fact were prohibited under that ordinance. The city's position was because the zoning ordinance did not list STRs as a permitted use under the use chart of the zoning ordinance that originally was adopted in 1982, that meant that STRs as a use were prohibited across the board throughout the entire city. Uh, that 2018 ordinance reaffirmed that position, or that was the city's goal. Uh, the court pointed out that cutting against the uh, city's position that STR uses were prohibited across the board since 1982 were the facts that the plaintiffs in the case had operated the STRs for several years without interference uh, and that city staff had said that the city 
had no regulations on STRs, and that the city had accepted STR uh, hotel occupancy taxes uh, during the time in which this, uh, uh, prior to the 2018 ordinance being adopted. Um, after the 2018 ordinance was adopted, the city had sent letters to all STR owners in the city, advising them of the adoption of that ordinance and the city's position and granting a 45 day grace period in which they must cease operations. The, uh, that prompted the STR owners to sue the city alleging multiple constitutional violations under a variety of theories, including uh, that the ordinance violated substantive due course of law um, under the Texas Constitution, uh, was preempted under other Texas state statutes, was unconstitutionally retroactive. The plaintiffs also sought monetary damages for uh, regulatory taking and injunctive relief. Uh, the court in the case disagreed with the city's position, uh, denied the city's plea to the jurisdiction and request for summary judgment, found that the city zoning ordinance's definition for single family detached dwellings did not prohibit STRs and found that STRs were a permitted use under the city zoning ordinance. Um, it noted that the private property ownership um, and the private property rights of the plaintiffs were a fundamental right, that the homeowners, the plaintiffs in the case, um, had a fundamental leasing right as property owners. That is one of a number of uh, rights that property owners enjoy, and that was what the court had, uh, had found. However, the court did say, it pointed out that, um, that the holding of the court was not that there was necessarily a fundamental right to operate STRs and deferred a decision on that to, uh, to uh, later proceedings in the case. Remember at this point, the Court of Appeals was reviewing the, the trial court's decision on a plea to the jurisdiction and a motion for summary judgment, which are not trials on the merits. And so the court deferred a decision on whether there is a fundamental right to operate an STR um, to a later time. Um, the homeowner, the court found also that the homeowners presented sufficient evidence of constitutional regulatory takings claims against the city, which could uh, potentially lead to a monetary award uh, against the city and in favor of the homeowners of the operators of the SCRs. The uh, court also said that the homeowners pled a valid claim against the city that the ordinance was unconstitutionally retroactive. So that 2018 ordinance uh, did not allow for grandfathering of those uh, presently operating STRs in the city, and the court found that that was improper. Uh, there was an appeal to the uh, Supreme Court of Texas, and uh, at this point, the parties have filed uh, briefs, uh, both on the merits and, at the, and for a petition for review. The court has not yet decided the petition for review, and so we don't know today whether the Supreme Court will review that case or not. Uh, just anecdotally, um, about one out of every three cases that get brought to the Supreme Court of Texas uh, where the, the parties are seeking a petition for review are in fact granted by the, the court. And so uh, those that are not granted don't get heard by the court. Um, so uh, of course, if the city loses either at the Supreme Court of Texas stage or or if the Supreme Court does not agree to hear it, the case will go back to the district court for a trial on the merits. Uh, the next case I'd like to talk about is one that Richard did touch on, and that is the case out of the Fifth Circuit decided in August of 2022, a couple months ago. And although that did involve a city of New Orleans ordinance, it is an opinion from the Fifth Circuit, which as Richard noted, has jurisdiction over Texas, and, uh, and so this would be binding precedent on the city of Plano, um, unlike the Fort Worth Court of Appeals decision that we just spoke about. Um, before 2016 in New Orleans, the city had prohibited owners in residential neighborhoods from renting their homes for less than 30 days. But at that, uh, but uh, as STRs began to explode in the city and there were calls on the city council to adopt additional regulations in 2016, the city of New Orleans implemented a licensing scheme, a program to grant licenses to STR operators and owners. Uh, 
in 2019, having determined that that licensing scheme did not go far enough, the City of New Orleans City Council adopted an additional requirement for STRs that the, uh, those that existed in residential neighborhoods must be uh, uh, owner-occupied. In other words, that the operator or the owner of the, the STR in residential areas of the city must uh, reside as their primary residence at the STR. And the, the way that the city would determine that is to determine whether, in fact, the owners had listed the STR as their homestead property for tax purposes and if so, that they could continue operating an STR if they did not list that property as their homestead property for tax purposes and therefore it was not their primary residence, then uh, they would prohibit those from being used in residential areas. Um, they also, the city also adopted some advertising restrictions, uh, which included a prohibition on advertising for illegal STRs, those without license to operate and ads for legal STRs with greater capacities than licensed for under the city's program. Uh, the STR owners in that case sued the city alleging various constitutional infringements including uh, regulatory takings, uh, a violation of the dormant commerce clause, uh, arguing that the regulations on owner-occupied STRs in residential areas discriminate against interstate commerce which had the effect of prohibiting out-of-state or even out-of-city owners from operating SDRs in those areas. And they also argued that it violated the, the advertising regulations, uh, violated the First Amendment to, to the U.S. Constitution. Uh, in the case, the court decided on a summary judgment basis um, that the residency requirement um, for the owner-occupied SDRs uh, was unlawful. Uh, and violated the dormant commerce clause of the U.S. Constitution. Um, and, and a key part of the court's holding was the finding that there were other reasonable non-discriminatory alternatives available to the city for regulating the conduct and the behavior that the, the, the city council's ordinance had sought to prohibit or to regulate. Uh, the court ruled that uh, SDR owner operator uh, uh, requirement to live in the state was unconstitutional. As I mentioned, it violated interstate commerce and that the uh, city, uh, the, the owners of the SDRs did not have a property right in license renewals, which is distinguishable from property rights in the home and the land. So you recall in the Grapevine case, the court did say that there was a fundamental right to lease one's property. In this case, um, the court made the point that there is not a fundamental right or a settled right to a renewal of a license under the licensing scheme, which I think is important uh, to understand that, um, as Richard mentioned earlier, that there, there could be a path for uh, deciding to adopt a regulation uh, that would grant a license or permit, and then should there be a problem with that STR, uh, after that permit or license has been granted, there could be a, a, a possibility that the, could, the city could refuse to grant another permit or license or, in fact, revoke that permit or license. And this holding from the Fifth Circuit is important to point that out. Um, and the note there that, of course, this is a binding precedent on the city of Plano because the Fifth Circuit does have jurisdiction over our area. Um, and, of course, that could change if the U.S. Supreme Court court uh, steps in here. We don't yet know yet whether there will be a, an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court in this case. Um, the next case I'd like to touch on is the City of Austin case referenced earlier. That's the Zatari versus City of Austin decided in November 2019 by the Austin Court of Appeals, which of course also does not have jurisdiction in the City of Plano, but um, would, would likely be seen as persuasive authority. Um, so in 2020, excuse me, 2012, the city of Austin adopted an STR registration ordinance. In 2016, after engaging in several years of studies and hearings on STRs, the city of Austin City Council adopted an STR, a more fleshed out, more um, uh, uh, comprehensive STR ordinance. One of the regulations within that ordinance was an immediate suspension of licenses for what they termed as type two 
STRs. Type two STRs under the city of Austin's ordinance uh, was defined as those that were not owner occupied, similar to what you saw in the New Orleans case. Type one was those that were owner occupied STRs and type three were those that were in multifamily areas or structures. Type two is the, um, was the type of STR um, licenses or permits that the, the, this court decided in the context of this case. Uh, part of that regulation also said that there would be an eventual phase out across the city for all non-owner occupied STRs uh, by 2022. Those, uh, those in type two under the Austin ordinance, this also could be referred to as a sunset of non-owner occupied SDRs across the city. Uh, the court decided that, oh, excuse me, uh, uh, going back in, into some more of the regulations that the city of Austin imposed as part of its more com comprehensive ordinance was a ban against all assemblies after 10 p.m. Uh, so there was a period from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. in which the, the ordinance banned assemblies um, on those private property areas. They uh, banned outdoor assemblies of more than six adults at any time, regardless of the time of day, uh, prohibited more than six unrelated or 10 related adults from using the property at any time, and it gave the city officials authority to enter and examine SDRs to ensure compliance with city code. All of those uh, elements of the city's ordinance were attacked by the plaintiffs in this case. Um, there were various theories that the plaintiffs brought for why they should win the case, including evasion of privacy, freedom of assembly, a violation of freedom of assembly and association under both the U.S. Constitution, First Amendment, and the Texas Constitution, uh, which has a similar provision in it, due course of law, equal protection, and so on. The Texas Attorney General's Office filed an intervention in support of the STR owners in that case and against the city. The city held, or excuse me, the court held that the sunset or the, uh, the, um, the eventual uh, prohibition against non-owner occupied STRs was unconstitutionally retroactive and void. And that finding was based on a provision of the Texas Constitution, Article 1, Section 16, which prohibits retroactive laws uh, from being applied uh, in certain cases. And in this case, the court found that, that this ordinance violated those uh, of that retroactive prohibition. And the court also held that the assembly regulations uh, were unconstitutional and void, um, relying largely on the constitution, the constitutional provision under the Texas constitution for the right to assemble. Um, Sorry, I'm going to catch up here. Um, the court in the Zatari case noted that the city did not have a compelling public interest in over-occupancy, disorderly conduct, public intoxication, noise, parking, and littering that were specific to STRs. In other words, the, uh, the, the record before the court in that case did not show to the court that there was a, uh, a compelling reason to treat STRs differently than other similarly situated uses. Uh, and so the court found that based on uh, its review of the record that that just wasn't shown, um, that the issues uh, uh, have been, uh, uh, there's, there was nothing in the record to show that there had been problems with specific STRs in the past. And in, uh, part of the court's finding was that in four years, the rev record showed that there were no citations issued to a licensed SCR for violating noise, trash, or parking ordinances, not, not uh, one citation. There were some notices of violation, which is kind of the process that you would go forward uh, with issuing a notice before actually citing someone and, and requiring them to respond in municipal court. There were seven notices of violations sent out for over-occupancy. Uh, two for trash receptacle issues, one for debris in yard, zero for noise or parking issues. And so based on that record, the court found that it was not compelling enough to establish SDR regulations as in the manner that the city of Austin did. Um, the court also noted that there was not a disproportionate number of complaints from neighbors on SDRs. Again, this is based on the record before the court in this case. 
uh, the court said that the regulation did not advance the zoning interest because both STRs and owner-occupied homes are residential in nature. And again, found that the ability to lease property is a fundamental right of property ownership, similar to what you saw in the uh, Grapevine case. And the ability to lease property is a fundamental right of property ownership um, as well. The ban on STRs in, the, in this case, those type two STR uh, regulations would result in a loss of income for the property owners and that the property owners had a settled interest in their right to lease on a short term basis. Termination of that settled right to lease was a significant impairment of the property owner's rights, according to the court. Uh, the uh, provisions relating to assembly restrictions or regulations uh, were found to be unconstitutional uh, based on that fundamental right to assemble. And the court said that this Austin could use general, more broadly applicable nuisance regulations that were already in place in Austin to handle issues with STRs rather than adopting regulations that were specific to STRs uh, in particular. And that the negative effects that were identified with the STRs in Austin were, um, were, were able to be dealt with under the city's existing nuisance ordinances. Um, and that there were less intrusive, more reasonable means to eliminate those problems that the city of Austin had found there. The city has asked, or did ask the Supreme Court of Texas to review the case. The court denied it. And so it's now uh, back down to the trial court. And so we're, this was again uh, on a summary judgment and a plea to the jurisdiction. So we don't have a full trial on the merits from this court, or this case like the others that we've seen. So uh, all these um, regulations or these holdings of the courts uh, could change uh, between now and, and when there might be a trial on the merits or where there is a dispositive appeal from a higher court. Um, the next case I'd like to touch on briefly is the Draper versus City of Arlington court, uh, court case that uh, was decided in July of 2021. Uh, in that case, the City of Arlington spent uh, many years, several years, on a comprehensive deliberative process uh, relating to SDR study uh, including the hiring of a consultant. Uh, they mapped the distribution of city STRs across the city using census tract data. They gathered citizen input through a number of town hall meetings, surveys, open houses, uh, and they had multiple committee meetings uh, at the city council level. The city passed two ordinances in 2019, uh, one a zoning uh, amendment and another a registration or permitting scheme. And in this case, uh, once those uh, ordinances were adopted, uh, the uh, plaintiff sued and uh, sought a temporary injunction in the trial court, and that trial court denied that temporary injunction, and that was what was brought up on appeal to the Fort Worth Court of Appeals. Uh, and so again, this is not a case where there has been a trial on the merits, and in fact, in this case, it is only at the temporary, it was only at the temporary injunction stage, which is very early on in the court proceedings. Uh, so what Arlington's uh, uh, proposal, uh, Ar Ar Arlington's approach rather to regulating STRs was to create a STR zone, a so-called STR zone within one mile of the entertainment district that I'm sure we're all familiar with in those high, um, highly tourist uh, trafficked areas of the city. Um, they also allowed for um, other STR use in other areas of the city as well. They conducted extensive mapping of census tract data that showed where across the city the STRs were largely being used and found that 13.5% of the STRs, uh, or excuse me, of the single family homes in the STR zone that they had designated were being used as STR, those within about a one mile radius of AT&T Stadium, uh, give or take. And so one of the other elements of the city's approach in that case was to uh, allow for STRs in what they termed a residential medium density zoning district, a high density a residential high density zoning district, residential multifamily zoning district, non-residential commercial district, and uh, mixed use zoning district. So the, the one area that the city said they would not allow STRs subject to grandfathering was in lower density 
single family districts that were not within the STR zone. Uh, and so the net effect of those zoning regulations was that there were thousands of parcels where STRs can be operated in the city and, uh, and, and in fact are, are currently being used as that. Um, so again, at the, uh, in the Arlington case, uh, part of the other regulations that the city adopted were an annual permit and $500 fee, an inspection requirements, proof of hotel occupancy tax payment by the operator, maximum occupancies with a presumption that there should be two per bedroom plus two limited to 12 total uh, occupants in an STR, noise restrictions, prohibitions against outside congregation or assembly between the hours of 10 p.m. to 9 a.m., trash placement requirements, uh, prohibition on advertisements of STRs for a special event, um, increasing uh, parking restrictions and limitations on the number of vehicles allowed in an STR, and a prohibition on the physical conversion of premises to add additional bedrooms for STR uses. So the STR uh, owners and operators in that case sued the city alleging various constitutional violations. Uh, once again, the Texas Attorney General filed a amicus brief in support of the STR owners and against the city. The plaintiffs were denied that injunctive relief, as I mentioned. The court upheld that denial, finding in favor of the city, allowing the city to continue enforcing the ordinance as it was written during the pending litigation. Again, this is at the early stage of the case. We were uh, at the temporary injunction stage, and so this uh, was not a case that was decided on the merits. And some of the evidence at the preliminary injunction hearing um, uh, is, is not necessarily the same evidence that can be developed at a full trial on the merits. That's important to, to keep in mind. Uh, and so uh, there was no guidance for cities yet from this case as to the validity of the Arlington ordinances because of its early stage in the process. Um, one takeaway from this case is that developing a data-driven, robust legislative uh, record may help avoid an injunction like what happened in, in this case. And uh, SDR uh, in this case did not have standing to challenge the assembly restrictions unlike what we saw in Austin, because none of them were in fact a tenant or a guest of the SDR. So it just turned out that none of the plaintiffs were actually tenants or guests, they were owners or operators. And so the court um, found that they did not have standing to bring that assembly uh, argument. Um, in this case, the Supreme Court denied the petition for review in January of 2022. And so it remains at the trial court level. Um, the next case, next set of cases I'll touch on briefly. Brian. Yes, sir. I'm going to stop you right here. We're going to go ahead and, and start the regular meeting, and I'll bring you back up yes, sir. Uh, as soon as we finish the pledge and the prayer. Thank you. I now declare the Plano City Council is reconvened in open session, that all members are present. We'll begin tonight's regular meeting with the invocation led by Reverend Dr. Victor Coleman, senior pastor with the Messiah Lutheran Church, and the Pledge of Allegiance and Texas Pledge led by Girl, Girl Scout Troop 6553 with McMillan High School. Would you please rise? We pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence with us here again this evening. We thank you for this wonderful city of Plano in which we live. We thank you for the love and the care you give to our city council members and to our city and to all of us here tonight. We ask your blessings on all the decisions that our city council members make tonight to serve you and to serve the people here in Plano. Give them wisdom and understanding to meet the needs of your people here in Plano. Continue to give us all opportunities to serve you and to make a difference for you in this special city in which we live. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.
and reciting the Pledge of Allegiance followed by the Church of Christ. Right, thank you. Be seated. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we have we have seats down here. I know you probably don't want to come to the front row. This is, but this is not church. Um, but uh, if if you don't want to stand, uh, there's there's more seats up front. Okay, uh, picking up where uh, we left off, uh, the next set of cases I'd like to touch on briefly is uh, are those cases uh, decided by Texas courts involving an HOA's attempt to regulate and prohibit STR usage within their neighborhoods. The first one uh, is a case decided uh, by the Texas Supreme Court in the uh, Tar versus Timberwood, Timberwood Park Owners Association which was the homeowners association issue there out of San Antonio. The HOA tried to ban SCR uses on the theory that it was a commercial use, not a residential use. The deed covenants in that HOA restricted or limited property to residential uses only. So the argument was it was a commercial use and therefore by definition uh, uh, prohibited under the HOA deed covenants. Uh, the court ruled in the case that the HOA can, could not ban an STR on the basis that it was a commercial use in conflict with the existing restrictive covenant that the property is limited to residential use. In essence, finding that the specific language of the HOA deed restrictions and covenants uh, did not uh, include STRs as a commercial use or identify them as an STR as a commercial use and found that based on the specific language at issue in the case, that it was a residential use and allowed under the HOA deed restrictions. The court did, when it made that finding uh, in 2018, find that it, the result might have been different if the language in the HOA deed restrictions and covenants were different as well, that if they were defined, if the SDRs were defined in a way uh, that could be excluded under the HOA's language, then the court might be inclined to agree that the HOA did have the right to regulate or to limit or prohibit SCR uses. Uh, one important thing to point out as we talk about these HOA cases is that they did not involve a city, and HOAs are not constrained by the same constitutional limitations that the city of Plano and other cities in Texas are. So many of the arguments that we spoke about earlier, uh, right of association, right of assembly, constitutional takings, um, precedents, and other, uh, re other type of constraints and limitations on the city's ability to regulate don't exist when we're talking about HOA rules and operations. Uh, the next HOA case is J. Bryce Holdings LLC versus Wilcrest Walk Townhomes Association, decided this year by the Texas Supreme Court. And in that case, like in the Tar case, 
the court found that the deed restrictions, neither the deed restrictions nor the property code uh, of the state of Texas authorized the HOA to impose short-term rental restrictions or prohibitions, but again noted that the deed restrictions permitted the neighborhood to amend their covenants if they so chose to uh, further restrict leasing and potentially the right, the ability of an HOA to be, uh, covenants to be amended and restrict uh, SDRs altogether. Um, another case involving an HOA is Chu versus Windermere Lakes HOA. That was divided by the 14th Court of Appeals out of Houston. And that was uh, two months ago in August 2022. In that case, there was an amendment to a subdivision's covenant restrictions, deed restrictions, which banned short-term leasing. And in that case, the Court of Appeals in Houston found that that was valid and enforceable against the homeowner. So the HOA went through the process that spelled out in the HOA deed restrictions to, uh, uh, to authorize an amendment to those restrictions and uh, in fact, to adopt a new ban on SDRs, and uh, the court upheld that. And in that case, the court cited the two previous opinions that I mentioned in Tar and Jay Bryce, those cases, finding that, uh, in essence, it all depends. The, the, the result rises and falls with the actual language of the HOA deed restrictions, and uh, there is uh, authority for HOAs, if their deed restriction language allows for it, to prohibit regulate, limit STRs. Again, those cases do not involve uh, the city. And so that's the uh, summary of cases that uh, we wanted to, to touch on. Um, there were some uh, kind of summary uh, level takeaways, if you will, uh, that we would like to touch on. Um, if, if now would be appropriate time to do that. We can wait. Whatever you want to do. Let me, I want to back up just a second here. Okay, so the first set of takeaways is if you want to prepare an ordinance. Um, note what Arlington did. I would ask that you can give that consideration if you're going to go that path. They passed two ordinances. One was a registration ordinance. The other was a zoning ordinance. You separated the two. The, and I think, I don't know why Arlington did it because I, I didn't represent them, but I think what part of their thinking is that the registration is likely to be upheld. The zoning will have a, a little more risk to it, and so they were trying to minimize the risk. That's worth consideration. And then if you want to talk about smart... STR ordinances, be sure that you are identifying what the problem is. So note what Arlington did. It looked at its entertainment district and then other areas where there were uh, STRs with a goal, it appears to me, of trying to preserve or have no STRs in single family, uh, the smaller, the regular single family residences. So it took higher density, single, uh, residential, medium density, uh, apartments, um, mixed use, and said you can do them there. So you've got to identify what the problem is, and it has to be based upon data. And then when you decide to do this, we need to check what the STR case law is at the time, and then you need to build a legislative record to support it if it can be supported. You don't need to make it up, obviously. You should avoid outright bans, at least for now, because the case law doesn't support it. Uh, uh, at this point, I think you should be wary of retrofitting STR regulations into existing definitions and regulations because those are not faring well. Now, this may change because the law is evolving. Uh, I don't think you should make a distinction between owner-occupied and investor-owned because the Fifth Circuit, which controls the city of Plano and Collin County, says that's not constitutional unless it's changed by the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, if you're looking at doing zones such as what um, Arlington did, make sure you have at least a rational basis to support the zoning decisions and you, use, and, and you follow the standard zoning process as I indicated earlier. Go through the whole full-throated zoning process, give everyone a chance to come and weigh in and consider all that. 
Uh, I think this gathering process would include looking at GS, GPS mapping, police calls, code complaints, and the like. Uh, you should be creating a prospective ordinance, not a retrospective, retroactive ordinance, because so far those are not doing well in the courts. Uh, finally, uh, I think you ought to engage with uh, the online platforms to see what support they can give cities uh, to help further regulate the concerns that the citizens have expressed, the laundry list of things that we talked about earlier. Finally, the, take, the, the basic takeaways or the summary takeaways, short-term rentals uh, are a regulatory challenge because the focus has been what can we do about those? What can we do about STRs? And right now that is not a winning argument. You're gonna to have to do it in the context of how you apply regulations citywide. Importantly, I think this may be the import, most important uh, observation I have about this is that the law is not clear uh, on a number of these issues. And, and so your decision to make a decision about zoning uh, could get you in a lawsuit. It, and I'm sure that it could come from either side because I'm sure that the, the passions are high on both sides. So you should be considering that. That doesn't mean you can't do something. Obviously, you could pursue a registration. You could actually go involved and get in, like we, like Austin did, get involved in a zoning process so that you can start getting the input. And these cases are going to get resolved at some point, and you'll have a better idea of what you can and can't do. Also note that the Texas legislature uh, has, at least in the past two sessions, proposed bills, several, several bills. Uh, none of them passed so far, but don't be surprised if it comes up again. And so I know your legislative committee will be monitoring that and hopefully giving input to uh, accurately and fairly represent your citizens. You note from these cases and from, and I can tell you from looking, from having prepared these ordinances, cities take different approaches from doing nothing to doing different levels of robustness of registration to totally regulating them or banning them. Uh, and so the cities are not uniform in what their approach has been. Uh, note that the Attorney General has been active in this area, has been intervening in these cases, and they, he's not been intervening on behalf of cities or the citizens, they, he's intervened on behalf of owners of STRs. Uh, the challenge for cities to adopt regulations is to balance the competing property interests with courts strongly favoring lease rights. Again, I don't know that the full fulcrum of lease rights has been uh, decided in this context, but right now the courts are being pretty clear that uh, a landowner has a, among the bundle of rights a landowner has when it has fee simple ownership is the right to lease. Now, how that affects an STR, I don't think is absolutely clear yet. The courts have been telling uh, cities that to balance the property interests, uh, you should be looking at nuisance ordinances, noise, the like, to address these issues. Whether it's for you know, parking or crime or noise or whatever it is, that's what the courts have been suggesting to you. I think there are other things that you can possibly do, and we've tried to outline those for you tonight. Finally, there, I think there's been some interest in HOAs regulating these, and so I want, we wanted to point out those cases that were that seem to be recent and relevant uh, to this discussion. And note that uh, HOAs may be able to address some of those, but HOAs are creatures of statute, uh, restricted uh, covenants are a matter of contract. And so they're gonna be treated a little bit differently, but it's worth, at least if, if citizens wanna ban them in their neighborhood, that's, a, that's an avenue they could look at by consulting uh, their HOA attorney. And with that, that concludes our presentation. We want to thank you for the opportunity to come and uh, share with you uh, our thoughts. Thanks, Richard and Ryan. They may have some questions for you in a second, but we're going to have uh, Chief Drain come up and uh, present uh, a couple of uh, slides.
Okay, uh, so I wanna give you a briefing on our calls for service data that we have at our um, uh, STRs. Uh, as you can see there uh, on, that, uh, uh, on that slide, we've got that first property up there. It's showing quite a few calls for service. Uh, those are mostly parking issues that are at that particular uh, STRs. And, uh, so, and, and, and for relatively minor, for minor things that are going on there. Uh, we've got um, one property on there that has been taken off in August uh, that was somewhat of a, uh, been somewhat of a, a problem property for us, uh, but uh, they were on Airbnb and Airbnb took them off uh, in, uh, in August. So here are some of the uh, calls for, the calls for data uh, type uh, calls that we have at our STRs. In fact, this is all of the ones that we have there, 105 are, are the total number of, of um, incidents that we've had year to date uh, through the end of September. Uh, and that one sex trafficking uh, call up there, that is the one that I'm sure most of you probably heard about on Next Door and that was in the media. Uh, that particular, and that has been the only prostitution related STR that we are aware of uh, at the police department. So uh, that uh, those people moved up from Dallas, as you probably read. We had received a tip uh, unrelated to Dallas about that particular STR uh, the weekend before it was raided. Our detective, we, we use a deconfliction method to make sure that we're not working on the same cases with other cities. And when our uh, detective went to deconflict that case, we found out from Dallas that they were working it. Dallas already had a warrant, so obviously we let them take that, and that was handled. <clears throat> uh, we got some feedback from Dallas on, on what they have. There were no minors, there were no juvenile women involved or anything like that. Uh, they were all adults and that uh, property was only in our city for less than a week. And as I said, we haven't had any other issues come up like this uh, at all. So uh, this is the number of uh, noise complaints that we've had uh, in our city, 27, uh, uh, 2,735 and uh, about 45 of those have been related to STRs that we know of about 1.6% of uh, our noise complaints. Now. Those, that noise complaint data is for all noise complaints, not just residents. It's kind of difficult to pull that, uh, to, to sparse that number out of that. And uh, this is uh, just trend data to show that uh, uh, the trend is going up uh, uh, for calls for service at our STRs. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Thanks, you. Paige Mims is going to have a few slides and then we'll be uh, available for questions. So, Mayor and Council, we wanted to address the questions that have come up about the hotel tax collection and why um, STRs are treated as hotel uses under tax law but not under land use law in Plano. So, the first slide is the definition of hotel from the Texas tax, tax code. And it specifically says in 156.001B, for purposes of imposition of a hotel occupancy tax under this chapter, hotel includes a short-term rental. So it's not because Plano has contracts with some of the platforms that the tax is collected. That is to streamline the tax collection and make sure that the burdens on the platforms or the owners of the properties and not Plano to kind of try to wrangle and chase down tax money. But with or without the contracts we have with the platforms, state law mandates that the owners or renters of these properties pay taxes. And so that's why um, they're considered this use under this law because it's very clear in the state law that an SDR is that type of use. And if we move on to the Plano zoning ordinance, um, STRs are not as uh, specifically addressed in our zoning ordinance. <clears throat> they don't fit in the definition of a motel hotel definition. Um, something that's not highlighted is that they're not designed for and occupied as temporary dwelling places. Um, also, uh, under hotel motel, you have to have four or more rooms suitable for daily or long-term occupancy. We know STRs may be less than that, maybe that, maybe more. Um, and it's required that hotel services, including daily housekeeping and upkeep of furnishings, are provided. And that's not necessarily true in STR uses uh, consistently. And it specifically says in our ordinance that this definition shall not include other dwelling units 
as defined by the ordinance. And Lisa, if you can move to the next slide, the definitions of dwelling and dwelling unit in our zoning ordinance include all the residential types of uses. So it's specifically not a hotel and a motel. If we can move on to the next slide, we have a definition for bed and breakfast in, and that is an owner or operator occupied residency requirement, which we now know from the new Fifth Circuit case that came out in August is not constitutional, and it requires up to five bedrooms. Again, STRs have any number of bedrooms in them from one or none. Sometimes I think if it's a studio up to maybe five or more. Um, and they provide for guest stays up to 14 consecutive days. And we know from the tax code that SDRs can be up to 30 days. And it also states that you shall not offer weekly rental rates. And, um, you know, I think maybe SDRs sometimes do that. And then we have one more definition on the next slide of boarding rooming house. And again, this doesn't neatly fit into this category. There is a plan, um, it was funded in the budget to redo the zoning ordinance comprehensively next year. And this is one of the items on the list is to realign some of our definitions because some of the similar type uses have different types of regulations and some are either outdated or have, um, have things that courts have determined are unconstitutional. So there will be some realignment of that. Um, and we know that from the presentation that the Abernathy Law Firm did, that the cities who have tried to use their definitions or the fact that it's not specifically regulated to, under a general prohibition, they have not been winning those arguments. So it's clear that the courts um, have indicated that they would like to see clear regulations specifically to STRs if you are going to implement some regulations. And so let's go to the next slide. Um, and so this just kind of summarized what I have just said. And so this is why we do not think our current definitions address SDRs and why we don't use our definitions to do that. Thank you. Any questions for uh, the attorneys or the chief or Paige? I, I have questions for the attorneys. Okay. Sorry. I'll get to you. Yeah, okay. No, no worries, no worries. After Deputy Mayor Pro Tem, too. You were very fast, Maria. No, i am got to be fast, especially in front of Anthony. <laughs> so, um, first of all, I want to um, compliment you on this very, very extensive and detailed um, summary of um, the STR. I, I, I found it to be very educational. I do have some questions. Um, uh, it, it sounds like, basically, what the court is saying is, that um, we cannot treat STR like a commercial um, property. We have to, if we are going to um, dictate or to um, put any type of restriction on the use of property, it has to be um, it has to be applied to all residential type um, prohibition or restriction. Am I correct about that? I think it's accurate to say that the courts have held that STRs are not commercial enterprises. Okay. And so they're gonna fall under the residential uh, area and you're gonna to have to treat uh, the STR as the way you treat other residents. Houses, yes. like my house. Yes. So, um, so my question next is, it sounds like Arlington um, a, approach appears to be more appeasing to the courts at this time because they've done a lot of data collection. They've done their research. They compiled their reason and rationale in making the decisions that they did and ultimately passing the ordinance that they did. Am I correct about that? Um, I think so. So may I make one comment about sure. that? So when I read those cases, I thought of sexually oriented businesses, regulated sexually oriented businesses which requires, because you're, you're invading somebody's First Amendment rights, you know, the right of assembly, all those claims have come up in SOB cases. And so this got a long history of what will pass the constitutional muster. And what I read in the Arlington case sounded a lot like what's required to uphold a sexual oriented business regulation ordinance. So 
I, I think you're right, and I think this is going to require that sort of substantive, thoughtful uh, fact gathering and be able to base your decisions on the facts and not the other way around. Okay, so basically, um, I guess my next question is, how long did it take Arlington to do that? And are we able to, as City of Plano, piggyback on Arlington's research so that we could cut down on some of the time that it would take to ultimately come up with our own potentially, you know, um, resolutions? So let me... So let me go back and refer to SLBs for a second. So the, some of the cities we represent, uh, we've relied on data that's been gathered by the city of Dallas because it does such a more robust job than the, city, the smaller cities that we represent. They're not two million people. Uh, I don't know if you can rely on Arlington or not, and I don't know how long it took because we maybe Ryan does. Yeah, the, the, the court in, indicated it was several years, um, but I don't know for sure how long exactly. I think some of the same concepts and, and, and fact gathering might be applicable to Plano, but some others might not be. And what I've seen so far is that you've already begun some of that fact gathering, just responding to citizen inquiries and concerns and complaints and the like, that you're already beginning to build uh, at least facts that would indicate to you, well, where could we regulate and where we couldn't regulate. And um, I guess ultimately the, the last question is, if the city were to lose on any type of litigation like this, um, is the court uh, permitted to grant attorney's fee to the winning party? So it depends on the cause, depends on the cause of action, but the cause of action that I've seen so far, the answer is yes. And they could award damages if some of the takings claims and the other things were, were found to be uh, valid. In other words, the city would have to pay their own attorney's fees and costs, and then they would also have to pay um, the complainants, the plaintiff's costs. Damages. Damages. Possibly. Yeah, so, so, I mean, obviously in these cases, one of the goals of the STR owner is to prevent the city from imposing the regulation, but for doing so, it wants to get reimbursed for its attorney's fees. And if it has a claim for damages, like a takings claim, then it wants to pursue that. Now, I can't, I can't tell you the outcome of those claims, but yes, that's a that's a possibility. Thank you. Certainly, Thank you. Councilmember Riccadelli. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I wanted to to first just note that I think to to the point that uh, that you touched on, Mr. Abernathy. I think we we have been in this process for a few years now. We've been getting reports and gathering data for, you know, I've been on council for five and a half years, and it feels like. A majority of that time we've been we've been looking at this issue so for for years now certainly I had a, a question for Chief Drain following up on uh, the report that you provided <clears throat> and thank you uh, Chief Drain for that great report uh, I noted in your report the discussion of 1.6 percent of uh, noise complaints in the year 2022 in Plano being associated with short-term rentals and uh, uh, not to give you a pop quiz, but if I remember numbers correctly from the presentations that uh, Curtis Howard has provided, uh, our current estimate of the number of short-term rentals in the city is something like uh, 600 and something. Is that Does that sound about right? Uh, yes, G roughly. Give or take, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, this, this may be something that's more in the planning department's uh, vein, but I believe we have upwards of 111,000 housing units in the city of Plano. Uh, I don't know if anyone... I'm, I'm, I'm getting a, a fairly affirmative roughly, nod yes. from the city manager, roughly. Yeah, I, th I think that may be a year or two old number, so it may be a little bit more now. But um, So just, just doing the quick math, it looked like uh, um, short-term rentals, you know, depending on how many, it's 600 and something, maybe somewhere around 0.6% of uh, housing units in Plano. And uh, it looks like... Uh, more than two and a half times uh, uh, that amount of noise complaints, 1.6% are associated with short-term rentals. D does that sound about right in terms of what the data is showing that there's a significantly higher incidence of noise complaints at short-term rentals? Well, the, the noise complaint data, I'm pretty confident yeah. in. The uh, 600 number that we're okay. using, uh, we Curtis gets that data from our, D our DNA. It's a okay. free service, and sometimes you get what you pay for sure, sure. with the free service. So I don't know if I would want to rely on that since we're not doing our own data collection for sure, to for collect sure. that. So, so I don't know if I would want to rely on that number. 
And in any case, we're talking about a relatively small number. I think it was 45 mm -hmm. was the number of uh, noise complaints at STR. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Is it tw is it is it uh, twice as large if your numbers are correct? That's that's accurate. But number one, I don't know if those numbers are correct. Number two, we are talking about pretty small numbers in any case. Sure, and and, and that makes sense. And thank you for that information, Chief. And as I recall from uh, Curtis Howard's presentation. Uh, is there a kind of a premium version of air DNA that might have more uh, more accurate data or um, or I guess through a registration program we can certainly gather more accurate data but we basically we can we can get uh, accurate data on uh, exactly how many uh, uh, short-term rentals are operating in Plano yeah well uh, and I don't know if it's air DNA there are services that okay. provide paid services that do sure. provide that service to us. I think some of the other departments may be looking at that. For our purposes, it's just, it's not worth the cost at the police department, sure. but uh, so we don't use that. And I think, but I think some others are looking at uh, getting a service like that. Okay, very good. Well, Chief Drain, thank you again for that information and for that excellent presentation. I appreciate you. All right. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. I don't know if my question's for you, Paige, or for the um, chief, but um, <laughs> whoever wants to answer, y'all can answer. Uh, so the My attorneys apologies. mentioned that one of the um, avenues we had is to increase our nuisance ordinances across the board for the whole city. So what do you see our ways are to currently um, beef up the ordinances that we have? Um, one thing we can do is uh, revisit our noise ordinance and see if there's any additional things that we can do on that ordinance to make it easier to file complaints in residential neighborhoods where there's a, more of an expectation of quiet after dark and that type of thing. So we could work on that as a staff. I'm, I'll defer to the chief on parking and uh, disorderly conduct and cr crime type ordinances. Well, I, you know, I think our ordinances are written pretty good. I, 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 the key is is uh, us being able to get problems to the platforms. We have good relations with both uh, uh, Airbnb and Verbo. We have people that we can talk to. They have a law enforcement portal where we can put things. We typically don't put problems like parking problems in there uh, in there because number one, sometimes you don't always know if the car is related to someone at that particular address. Number one, and the problems that we've been going on, like that very that very top address that we saw there, it's cars parked uh, going the wrong direction on the roadway. That's on. That's going to probably be on every residential street that we have. We have someone who calls about that consistently at that er, at, at that location, and so we don't put that kind of data in there. But if we are going back out on the same location on a noise complaint, you know, you know, normally just like any other citizen, we go out. Uh, the first time we, we ask them, we don't take enforcement action. We ask them to, to uh, turn the music down or get the noise down. But if we have to continue to come back out, obviously uh, we're going to take enforcement action. And then we're also going to input that data into the law enforcement portal of those platforms. So I think that that's more the key we can, be, we can work on. I'm not sure what refining we can do on the, on the ordinances because I, I think they're fine as they are. Well, on the, um, to her point of making it easier to make calls, have you... Do you feel like it's easy for you to, if somebody does have a noise complaint, for you, your officers, to get out there in time for them to witness the noise violation? I know that there's been some concerns about about that. Well, sometimes they make it out there and sometimes they don't, but I don't think anything we write in an ordinance is going to have any impact on that. That's just a matter of circumstances. But typically, we, we get out there with the, with, the, um, uh, with the SDRs, yeah, the noise is typically still going on when we get out there. That's not a problem. But but sometimes at a, at a regular residence, someone could have their music up, and by the time we get out there, it'll it'll go down, or a dog can be barking, and by the time we get out there, the dog has stopped barking, you know, for whatever reason. So, <clears throat> Councilman Williams. Um, thank you. Also, a question for the chief. You didn't have to go all the way back to your seat this time. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um, so I, I did the same uh, math that Councilman Riccadelli did, and uh, it, it looks like noise complaints are twice as likely at short-term rental properties than at all other properties. But that's just looking at all aggregate noise complaints. Right. On the first slide you showed, and that was out of 45 noise complaints for short-term rentals. On the first slide you showed, it showed 105 complaints of all types, and that was only at the short-term rentals that had three or more complaints lodged. Um, I would like, I know you don't have this with you right now, but I would like to see um, data on all 
um, complaint types for all short-term rentals compared to uh, calls for service to all property types to do the same kind of calculation, but not just for noise. Does that make sense? Yes. Like all calls for service for short-term rentals across all the types of calls for service, whether it's you know, for something as egregious as sex trafficking or just parking issues, mm -hmm. um, uh, compared to the same data set for all properties. And I, even in this, I was just assuming a flat thousand, thousand short-term rentals in the city to make the math easier. Okay. Right, yeah. So I think we can get that data. And uh, obviously, as you said, I don't have it tonight, but we'll get mm -hmm. it sent back up up the channel. Thank you, Chief. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Councilman Brady. Chief, you're excused. <laughs> uh, I, have, I have a couple of questions for the attorney. Just a couple of clarifications because there has been a lot of data and a lot of information that's provided in the presentation. Um, I just wanted to get kind of a clarification of my own and, and, and see if that clarification is correct. From what I can see from a short-term rental um, in a defensible position um, in the legal system, they're basically claiming um, that they have a, that uh, any kind of regulation is a constitutional infringement, and they have a uh, fundamental right of property rights, and therefore uh, have uh, leasing rights on that property as well. And that seems to be supported by the Court of Appeals, the Fifth Circuit Court, the Texas Supreme Court, and the Attorney General of the State of Wisconsin, or State of Texas, is that correct? I, th I think it's fair to say that uh, that certain types of regulations uh, have been struck down uh, by the courts that have had an occasion to review those up to this point. I don't know, and I would say that uh, any type of regulation on STRs uh, is subject to challenge or, or has been uh, struck down, but certainly, those uh, regulations that cities have adopted that the courts view as going too far uh, have been subject to challenge and have been struck down so far by the courts. Uh, I think there remains to be a lot said about that uh, at the Texas Supreme Court level uh, and as those cases continue working their way through the process. Yeah, the other part of that is um, it seems that, to that. Yes, sir. Also, the Dallas Court Appeals, at least to my knowledge, has not issued rulings along these lines. So some of these cases are coming from Fort Worth and not from Dallas. Not, you can argue what Fort Worth says and, this, and it can be law, but I mean, if you're looking to see what your area is gonna do and then look at the Dallas Court of Appeals. And I don't think there's any decisions out there about it, but I could be wrong. Okay, so it, it seems to me that the most defensible part on even for residents um, and for the city itself, or residents, it's their homeowners association. That seems to be the strongest um, defensible position is covenants within a homeowners association or if the lack of a homeowners, homeowners association, the development of one. Um, and the other part of it being very carefully um, uh, designed regulations because otherwise I don't see federal or state um, laws really um, being anything but supportive to property rights. So, Correct? And, and Ryan may have a different view. My, my view is that the contractual agreements in Texas, if they're clear and unambiguous, um, they're probably going to be upheld. So that's, a, that's an HOA. There are a lot of snarly issues about HOAs and how they've created them. I've been involved in a number of them. It, it's a different area. Uh, I don't think it's uh, comparable to what happens city. Uh, the distinction here is that the city is typically <coughs> imposing regulations with or without the consent of somebody. And so that's why you begin implicating constitutional rights and other things that make it a little bit iffy. But that does not mean that you don't have some regulation, regulatory authority, it's just, how far is it? And I think the courts are going through the process of determining well, where is that? Uh, and of course it evolves too, but, but at some point there's going to be um, at least what appears to be mostly settled law about what you can do regulating STRs. I just, right now I would be uncomfortable telling you that it's clear and unambiguous about what you can and can't do. 
Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Let me get Shelby, you had one more question. Uh, yes, this time for uh, the attorney. I didn't want to make the chief go sit down again. Um, <clears throat> a couple of questions. So you covered how the um, courts have upheld the idea that uh, short-term rentals are not considered commercial. Uh, can you explain their basis for that reasoning? I'm assuming hotels are considered commercial. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Then what, was, what have been the court's reasoning for not considering short-term rentals to be commercial? Yeah, I think the, the Grapevine case um, is probably the one where that issue has been brought up uh, uh, most clearly. And I think in that case, because of the way that the city uh, had adopted this ordinance reaffirming its prohibition, it, uh, it, it considered uh, the use as being just one that was not allowed in the city, whether residential or commercial. Um, and there were arguments that, uh, in that case, that that it should be treated as a commercial use. And uh, ultimately, the, the court, I don't know that gave, gave us much guidance on its rationale for that um, because of the way that that case played out in that court. Um, I think if you look at, as Paige mentioned, the ordinance that you have uh, on the books today and the definitions in that ordinance, um, I, I think there is some question, or quite a few questions about whether it can be argued or, or demonstrated that a short-term rental is a commercial use and should be treated as those other uses. You know, when, when we're talking about zoning use definitions, uh, you know, th there are quite a few definitions and um, whether they are designated as a residential or a commercial use doesn't necessarily end the analysis. It, it uh, also often comes uh, into uh, whether, uh, what, what is the specific regulation that you're, you're imposing on those uses. So I, I don't know that we've necessarily got a lot of uh, uh, clear guidance from the court so far in the city cases and the HOA cases that commercial versus residential dichotomy has been brought up much more often and in those cases, based, again, on the specific definitions in the HOA regulations and limitations, the courts found that those were residential uses and not commercial uses, based on the record before them. Okay, so if I'm understanding correctly, um, based on both the, uh, the city cases, maybe the court just didn't specifically address that issue because it was busy addressing other issues. Um, and in the cases of HOA, it might have just been down to a nuance of language. So Correct. I also wasn't Grapevine. They wasn't one of the arguments the uh, the STR owner made is that the Grapevine had I'm sorry yeah had been allowing those for six years. Right. So I mean, I think the court appeals. I don't know what the court appeals is thinking, but I, it seems to me that it's fair to, that you could surmise that maybe the court appeals were thinking. Well, you thought it was you Grapevine thought it was residential for six years, and now you've decided it's. Commercial, okay. because if it had been residential, you would have done something about it and excluded that use from the residential district. So, I don't, I don't, but I don't know. Potentially based on Grapevine Zone precedent. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I also wanted to understand <clears throat> in the uh, case of New Orleans, um, if I understood correctly, you said that the interstate, <clears throat> uh, in state residency requirement was found to be unconstitutional under the uh, Commerce Clause. But as I understand it, the Commerce Clause simply gives commer uh, Congress the power to regulate interstate commerce. What was, what was the court's nuance there? Yes, sir. So the, the, it's actually the implication of the interstate commerce uh, constitutional regulation. It's, it's what the courts have called the Dormant Commerce Clause. So the implication that Congress is, uh, is the one that should regulate interstate commerce, meaning that other governmental entities like states and cities should okay. not be regulating interstate so commerce. So it's the concept of preemption. Yes. Exactly. It's, it's in large part a preemption type okay. argument. Correct. And my last question, um, you mentioned retroactive prohibitions a couple of times. Um, what is the court's, how is the court defining retroactive? Because if you're simply saying going forward, something is now illegal, how is that considered retroactive? Yeah, so the, there's a constitutional provision under the Texas Constitution that, that would limit and uh, prohibit the city's ability to, to impose a retroactive uh, 
uh, ordinance or law where it is taking away someone's rights that existed before that time. Okay. So in other words, if, if it was a position of the city that today people have the right to operate STRs and, and that's one of their, their rights that they have, they have enjoyed, by taking that away and doing that in a retroactive way, meaning you cannot continue it once we adopt this okay. ordinance, that would potentially run afoul of the retroactive okay. uh, clause of the Texas Got Constitution. It. Thank you. Council Member Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Richard, right, uh, we, we've heard a lot you know, tonight about the rights and short-term rental property owners and uh, what can't be done. It, in, in reviewing all the data and everything you look for cases, has, has there been any consideration given to the rights of the adjacent property owners and their right to have peaceful, tranquil use of, of their property. Is, is, was any of that considered in any case law anywhere that you saw? Yeah, yes, sir, there has been. And I think that you see in the court cases, uh, uh, the courts trying to balance those two and understanding the, either the city's or the HOA's role in also balancing those competing interests. And I think the, the courts, frankly, um, are struggling with that just the same way that you guys are, the same way HOAs might be struggling with how to balance those competing interests. Um, the courts certainly have said, or in the, at least so far in the, in the cases, have said that there are a number of concerns brought to light with STRs and neighborhoods and single family districts. And, um, and the, the job of the courts and, and the city and the HOAs is to how, how do we appropriately balance those? And I think we're at the start of a lengthy process, uh, unfortunately, in trying to determine what is the appropriate balance. And one size may not fit all. So in Plano, it may look one way, and in another city, it may look somewhere something different. Um, and so I, I think the courts have said, certainly identified all the concerns that uh, other residents have brought forward about uh, STR uses, and uh, and certainly doesn't in, in any of the cases I've seen the courts are not diminishing those, and is not saying that uh, I'm not seeing the courts say that those are not valid, legitimate concerns. It's just a question of how do you balance potential rights on this hand versus potential rights on the other, to end up to a in a situation where you know th there's an appropriate balance. Gotcha. Can, I, can I add one thing to that? Yeah, so, sure. It, these cases have also emphasized that cities should be using um, regulations that have been in place for a long time, the nuisance regulations. And I think that's one, I don't, they didn't say this, but I, what I was taking from it is they're trying to find a way to uh, assure that the rights of the neighbors and those in the neighborhood are protected and they're looking for how can you let uh, the cities know what you can go to, and they're encouraging that. I'm, I'm not saying that's the answer. I'm mm -hmm. just uh, I'm saying one of my perspectives was I think that's one of the things they're trying to address and come up with ideas, and that's I think that's an idea they. So they so it, it, you you sound like from what I've seen and what I hear you saying, you, you feel that maybe Arlington seems to to have been so far maybe a little bit more successful in the court cases because the 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 data that uh, that they gathered and they used because as i said there, there's rights on both sides both property owners have rights and somewhere somewhere there's got to be a balance and from what i'm hearing you say is that if you have the right facts you can prove something's a nuisance or something's not a nuisance you can better come up with ways to to control it to where it, it is uh, beneficial to, to the city as a whole and to the residents as a whole. Is, 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 is that correct? The, Did I hear that correctly? I, I think the, yes, sir. I think the courts are, uh, are bound by the law and the law on a number of these constitutional issues requires a compelling interest for the city to act. And then it has to come up with the most narrowly tailored purpose to achieve that. And so that's, and so whenever, and that's why I was talking about other regulatory schemes that cities have employed about regulating certain types of, of uh, conduct that implicates the First Amendment and other, and other constitutional rights. Is if you can build a robust case and identify why there is a compelling need to do something, and then you look for a narrowly tailored uh, response for it, 
then your chances of being successful are a lot greater. And I think that's why. And who knows what's going to happen in the Arlington case? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I think the Arlington case ordinance has a better chance of success because it appears to have done that. And again, I don't know all. All we know is what the, what's in but, the case. But I right. want to point out one nuance about the Arlington case while we're talking about that. Um, I think the, the cities have been largely unsuccessful in targeting SDRs with specific nuisance regulations because the courts have found in those particular fact instances the data didn't support it. And so they didn't think it was a compelling interest or narrowly tailored, so they think you should use the nuisance ordinances you have at large to deal with those particular instances of parking, trash, crime, whatever. Arlington has some assembly restrictions on its registration program, and the court in that case found that the homeowner plaintiffs did not have standing to challenge the assembly restrictions that were very strongly struck down in Austin. So those aren't being evaluated right now by the court because there's not a plaintiff there that has the authority to challenge that because you need a tenant or a guest of one of these STRs and they don't have that right now. So I wanna be careful and I do think that Arlington did a great job in the data development and it's very robust and they put a lot of thought into hiring a consultant and mapping and creating their zoning regulations, which I think they have a good chance of moving forward with in a successful way. But I do think they may have some issues that will not be evaluated by the court because there's not a plaintiff and I don't think cities should take that to mean that's okay because it was very strongly rejected in Austin. I think that's a good comment, and I didn't mean to suggest that. I mean, I was trying to tell you, I don't know what's going to happen in the case. So uh, that case hasn't been tried yet. So we don't know. But I, I do think the approach that Arlington is taking, uh, it looks like, I haven't seen other data, but it looks like it's a good approach if you want to regulate based upon zoning because you're building, assuming it, it grounds where you're trying to go. Okay. Jim, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Just to follow up, so basically following up on what Council um, and Williams and uh, Smith has talked about, it would seem that based on the case laws that um, going back to the drawing board, which is the zoning um, definition of uh, what is considered residential, what is um, prohibited within or uh, within the neighborhood would be probably the most logical approach based on what has been you know, coming down from the court and court of appeals. Does so that sound I, right? So I would caution you because the courts are fine, and I think this is just basic property law. The bundle of rights you have when you own a property, when you own your home, includes the right to lease. The question is, where, how far does that right to lease extend? and what limitations can you place on it? And at least in this context, I don't know the answer to that question. So, so my question though is specifically, if we were uh, wanting to do something to protect both the rights of our neighbors as well as um, you know, the STR to make sure that they don't get chipped, um, the, the place to go is back to the drawing board in which is the zoning. Um, our, our zoning ordinances. Is that is that what we're, we're saying? I'm, I, I'm, that's a, that sounds a lot like a decision that people who get elected to office make about policy <laughs> and so, and so I don't think I should be telling you what to do. I'm but isn't that what Arlington did? I mean, they, they basically um, modified, or I don't, I, maybe it's that true case, where they went back and they modified um, the the definition and in order to... Well, re remember they did two things. Yes. They started with the registration. Yes. The registration... Which we are, I mean, which I think is in, on our okay. plate too. So, I mean, that, that, that's not, not something that yeah. I'm actually but, worried but about. But that gives you, I mean, that's another tool. That's another uh, uh, tool in your toolbox to use to be able to get data, to have enforcement, to improve the ordinances you have that apply everywhere that gives you more information because I know that Chief Drain, because I'm familiar with other cities that have this problem, it, it, if you don't get a report, it's hard to go find out. Or if you get there and you don't hear the noise, it's hard to sign, issue the citation. So I think if you're asking me, do I think zoning is a way to approach it? Yes, it's, but you need to understand the limitations. 
Understood. Thank you so much. So, Appreciate so it. I think, Councilman, what we put in our slides is in our red, yellow, green. It's yellow. There's some risk with it because as Mr. Abernathy and Ryan Pittman are saying, the case law is not near developed on that issue, but we feel like because Arlington survived the injunctive relief that if you have robust data-driven um, support that you could take some risk there and do that. Yeah. And uh, just a, a quick question. Sorry. Go ahead. I just, I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm understanding correctly. So um, on the Arlington approach that, that I understand that litigation is still ongoing, but that seems to have been successful so far, even where they allow short-term rentals, those short-term rentals require a license. And if they have multiple violations of pre-existing nuisance laws, that license is then revoked and, and the courts have not enjoined the enforcement of that? Yeah, that, that's right. Uh, part of what you see in these cases where there is a licensing or registration or permitting scheme, um, there often is, and I think it's true in the case of Arlington, uh, a process for either revoking an existing license or permit or refusing to issue a new one, provided that, and this is important, provided that there has been a finding on the merits of a certain level or number of Violation. So it couldn't be, I, I would have concerns from a due process standpoint to say if you've just been cited for, you know, five, six, seven noise ordinance violations, that that would mean the city could revoke that permit. But uh, if there has been a finding uh, from a court that's no longer subject to appeal and is final, um, I, I think there are, certainly are cities that have gone with that approach and, and built into that system or process a number of other due process um, decision points for appeal of that SCR owner should the city wish to revoke or rescind or refuse to issue a new permit. So uh, that's one of the ways in which the cities have found to uh, um, sort of target those what they might consider to be problem properties. But at the same time, having said all that, uh, we don't have a decision on the merits from any of these cases where uh, an owner has challenged that type of process. Okay. So it's still a bit of an unknown. Okay, well, th thank you, Mr. Pittman, and thank you also, Mr. Abernathy, for all of thank that great sir. information. Councilmember Holmer. Uh, yes, and looking at Arlington, if someone has a permit and they are cited for a nuisance uh, violation, who is cited? Is it the guest at the, at the location or the property owner? Yeah, so I, I think it, it depends uh, in part on what the violation is um, and the ordinance that's being enforced. Um, I, if we're just talking about noise ordinance as an example, um, I, I don't know specifically what Arlington uh, does, but I would assume that what they do is similar to what other cities do, which would be to cite the actual people who were engaged in the conduct that led to the violation. So in that case, it, it most likely would be the tenant or the guest that was cited. Um, but these cities that have gone to this licensing or permitting scheme would um, potentially hold the owner or operator of the SCR uh, responsible if there are a certain number of violations found and determined finding of guilt or a plea of no contest presented by whoever was cited but that was identified as being on that property or, or associated with that property. And that's where some of those cities have, uh, have it, at least in their ordinances, again, untested, the ability to revoke or refuse to issue that new license. Okay, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we, uh, we're moving to comments of public interest. There are over 26 of you. Which, have, which are, don't have anything to do with STRs, it's coming up. What I wanna, wanna say is we're gonna move item five, which is STRs, to the front of items of, con, uh, items of individual consideration. Now we're gonna hear comments of public interest. What I wanna say before uh, Ms. Henderson starts is we're going to limit everyone's comments to a minute and a half. So the 26 people that are speaking on comments of public interest, you have a minute and a half. It'll exceed our 30 minute uh, number by a lot. And then 
for the SDR folks, uh, it will also be a minute and a half. I'm going to play it straight across fair. And uh, with that being said, like I said, we have 26 speakers here uh, to start with. We'll do the uh, consent agenda and then put item five right up next, okay? Comments of public interest. This portion of the meeting is to allow up to three minutes per speaker with 30 total minutes on items of interest or concern and not on items that are on the current agenda. The council may not discuss these items but may respond, respond with factual or policy information. The council may choose to place the item on a future agenda. Our first speaker this evening is Patricia Cole, and she will be followed by Sharon Overall. Good evening. My name is Patricia Cole. My husband and I reside on Bright Star Way in Plano 75074. I'm here to protest the last uh, session that you had where you defied the planning department and the PNZ department and decided to go ahead and allow a developer to develop multifamily housing at the corner of Jupiter and Los Rios. I want to know how many people actually, how many people of our council checked into the owner of the developer. He is involved with over 20 other companies. Also, he just built in San Antonio in 2020 a multifamily housing unit like he's proposing, and they have constant complaints. The, the, uh, the renters say, we do not give them a good rating. They get a two out of five stars. They don't complete maintenance work. They don't take care of the garbage. They don't take care of the property. Now, is that what we're seconds. going to be faced with? It sounds like it to me. We've been, we've been told that the, the council and mayor listen to us, but we time and time again, I've got several examples where it's an, oh no, it was, that was a previous group, or no, we just don't think that's gonna work. So let, just beware, there's a lot of people across Plano that are uh, familiar with this particular decision. And Time. we'll think about it when they come to the polls. Thank you. One of the city council's duties is to pass ordinances to protect the citizens of Plano from harm pass an ordinance that prohibits cigarette smoking on city-owned property and prohibits smoking someone's smoke on private property from drifting onto someone else's property or public property without their consent. Dear smoker, have you killed anyone today? What about the first grader with asthma waiting at the bus stop who scrambled to find his inhaler in his backpack while you walked by smoking? Are you sure the elderly man who collapsed at the mall as he walked through your cloud of smoke didn't have a stroke just for trying to go to the mall? Or your neighbor with a heart condition who was enjoying his backyard early today until you went outside to smoke? When the plume of smoke drifted over him, he rushed inside clutching his chest. What about your adult child who lives with COPD because they grew up with you smoking right around them? Have you checked on them today? What about your neighbor with emphysema who was having a cup of coffee on their patio this morning and had to rush inside when you went outside to smoke? Is she okay? Are you sure? Dear smoker, have you killed anyone today? Are you sure? Thank you. The next speaker is Russell Atkins, followed by Lovepreet Singh. Good afternoon, Mayor, Councilman. Thank you for this time to come and speak. I'm here to speak on the um, 
planning and zoning that you have that you approved on um, last last month. I attended a planning and um, uh, zoning meeting, which that was unanimously voted down eight to zero. There was over 800 um, petitions sent out to the local members in that community where I believe 800 disapproved of it. And I wanted to come here and as a, I'm a, a resident of Plano. I was born in Lubbock, raised in Houston. I've lived here since 2007. I live on 3304 Silent Oak Lane. Um, I've come to ask if we could go back and look at this decision. If we could take this plan and maybe try to relocate it. I understand the ramifications of um, lawsuits, different things like that. This is not the right location for this plan, for this project that you approved um, for, for many reasons. Um, traffic, uh, festivals that we have there, different things like that. So I'm asking if we could retable this and look to see if we could find seconds. somewhere else to go to try to make this plan work for not only the residents of Timberbrook, but the city of Plano, because this is not going to be good for this area. Um, many of you probably won't be here to see this when it does, but I'm telling you, it's not going to work. And so as I close, I'll tell you like this, Dr. King said, and the reason I came here, our lives begin to end the moment we remain silent on things that matter. And this matters to us. Thank you. Uh, we can respond with factual information, correct? Um, and we discussed this at the last meeting. Please correct me if I'm wrong. If I'm accurate, uh, alternate locations were proposed, but um, were not uh, accepted by the applicant. Is that correct? I uh, only got a minute and a half to speak, so I'll get right to it. Talking about that same Los Rios and Jupiter development, um, I believe truly that this council is forced to make a very bad decision. Uh, that decision, which I'm sure many of you view as a small sacrifice, has essentially developed into a situation where thousands of homeowners in this area feel hurt, bet betrayed, and misled, and lied to. Uh, for me personally, after exploring multiple lots, multiple cities, my father-in-law up there, convinced me to build a house, a house at 6604 Jupiter, right next to that development. Uh, I was done after much thought and full due diligence. I personally spoke to PNZ and was assured that the property right next door to mine was a single family. Uh, I was told that the comprehensive plan for Plano would provide me peace of mind because nothing else could potentially be built there. I was excited to build this home. Almost two years later, after fighting through price hikes, setback after setback due to COVID, damaging the industry, I'm at the final stages of attaining one of my most significant life goals, a home. I've invested every penny that I have and likely every penny that I'll make in the next 20 to 30 years into this. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Now that I've seconds. finally reached the stage, I'm told that the entire plan has been thrown out the window. <clears throat> that existing citizens of the area will be sacrificed for the greater good. It's an absolute tragedy. During the meeting where the vote was casted, there were many comments made by this council where it was obvious that the city council didn't think that this was a good idea. PNZ didn't think it was a good idea. It was a very apparent thing that nobody sitting in front of me today thought it was a good idea. Now I'm gonna ask you all a question. In fact, I'd like to ask you to raise your hand if you agree with the following statement. In this instance, the variance to the comprehensive plan was agreed upon solely due to the threat of a lawsuit. Please raise your hand if you think that's true. Nobody. Huh? Your, time, your time's up. Thank you. Guys, guys, don't. I appreciate it. Thank you. Very telling. The next speaker is a tender man and he will be or she will be followed by Lydia Ortega. My name is Paul Mann, and I live in 6612 Jupiter Road. I am the 
guilty father-in-law I was just mentioning, who convinced him to give up all his uptown ideas and all that, to come to the city and I'll be my neighbor. You guys change the rules. I have something to say. Could have taken three to four minutes. Time was allowed to five minutes, now it's minute. What do I do, give copies to everybody? What can I say in a minute when I came prepared to talk for three or four minutes? Last meeting, the rule was changed because I could not, we could not register one second late. We couldn't speak. This time we come to speak, other, th other things are priority and we have one minute. One minute I have is, I am being railroaded in this zoning change individually. I had a road access given to me by city of Plano when I bought, before I bought the property. I cannot explain in one minute why this road went away. In 2015, I went to the city when the single family development was approved and the city agreed with my question and my note and my information and they made the developer make me an access road. Same note, same information I took after you guys approved this dirty zoning, went back to the city, now what happened to my road? Nothing changed. I have the same notes, same promises, same thing I had in 2015. This time, city's answer is, city is not obligated to give you an access. What the hell? Why, do I, why can't I be treated as a tax-paying citizen better than a San, San Antonio investment? Thank you. They have all the rights and I have nothing. I need the road instated. Anybody who wants to meet me individually, I can explain the whole story. And if you don't approve it, at least listen to me. The council people have to listen to me one at a time or all of them. I cannot be railroaded. After 26 years, I have been sitting on a pillow of promise that whenever a development happened to my property, I'll be taken care of. And somebody you. has to listen to me. Thank here you. or in their own offices. We'll do it. Hi, Lydia Ortega. I'm here to speak on the eminent domain action on the Montessori's children's home. It's an action against a small business, because I have a question for you all. Does Plano still value small businesses? The Montessori children's home continues to exist because families value the services provided, so much so that the school cannot meet demand. I know the master plan is not carved in stone. I thought it was. But planning and zoning regularly collaborates with large landowners and developers to reach agreements on the number of rental housing units and the commercial activity necessary to be profitable. The master plan is certainly malleable when big developers and profitability are involved. I think that planning and zoning should be equally malleable in an eminent domain case, particularly when there are options that would provide for both the public good and allow a small business to grow. This is an issue of fairness. Ms. Safi has provided such an option. She worked in good faith with planning and zoning to reach an agreement on a portion of the property for the proposed seconds. bike trail. This option may not please the architects who consider aesthetics or engineers who count costs, but neither group considers values. It's up to the city council to weigh value. And the value Plano parents place on the Montessori's children's home is evident in their actions. They are voting with their dollars for this small business. Time to compromise, folks. Thank you. The next speaker is Joan Conkle, who will be followed by Sydney Shelton. Joan Conkle, 3101 Bruton Drive, Timberbrook Estates. I'm here to talk about the rezoning at Los Rios and Jupiter. Um, much of what I wanted to say has already been said, but I have to say that I find it incredulous that we can talk about the property rights of the neighbors of the adjoining property on the STR discussion 
what about the property rights of the owners of the other properties at Jupiter and Los Rios? Um, I just, um, I, I have several questions. Um, what were your reasons for the denial? Um, a discussion in executive session, a fear the federal government suing the city, a discussion, or I'm sorry, was the approval offered as an appeasement? Why was the property south of Medical City turned down? What was the reasoning for approving the letter of support to begin this process? It was stated that this zoning request needed to be approved so that our zoning decisions remain our own and not to give over control of our zoning decisions seconds. to the federal government. In essence, haven't we done that? Well, good evening. My name is Sydney Shelton. I'm here to talk about the eminent domain for the MCH, Montessori Children's House. My four-year-old has been attending MCH since he was one, and there are a few child development daycare centers near our home in Plano, like us and many other families with young kids in whom have the priority of giving their child a safe education and positive mental development have chosen MCH. Because of its reputation and excellent child development with access to the outside and natural and nature within a safe environment. We have invested into what this school currently has to offer with its excellent staff and safe access to nature and the vision of what the school will be if MCH is allowed unobstructed access to its school property without the fear for the safety of their children from the proposed added visibility from the public when school property and its unobstructed access to nature is taken away. We plan on enrolling our sixth month old 16 month old in which he would be attending for the next four years, but with his safety concerns added by the seconds. city of Plano's proposed eminent domain take over part of MCH's property to extend a public bike path right next to where children currently play and get out of out on supervised nature walks will put the community's children in direct visibility for the temptation of the public, plus will take away from the natural beauty and nature that the public has to offer. If this continued safety of community's children isn't a priority for the city of Plano, then please instead protect the vision of what Ms. Effie has dreamed from the beginning of what MCH could be, when children have unobstructed access to little nature that remains in Plano. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Sheila Mubarak, followed by Alexandra Soberall Butler. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm going to go fast too since we have a minute and a half. I'm speaking for Montessori Children's House as well. Last time I was here, I was for my son. He won the wrestling state championship. So this is a very turn of events for me. But I'm here as an early childhood expert, infant toddler expert, and a child care health consultant. You're taking away nature from children. Do you know what it does for children, having this access to outside? Do y'all know? Y'all have children. Being outside is invaluable. There's no money you can put on it. I know intimate domain says that you can give fair, just amount of money for this land. There's no amount of value you can do for nature. I have a list of all the attribute nature does, but we know, we know what nature does for us. Do you know since the 1980s, 30% of child, our children have lost 30% of their muscle tone because they don't play outside. Outdoor classrooms have moved forward with the Olay movement, which is the outdoor learning environments. We need to keep this in Plano. It's one of the few accesses they have. I don't know if y'all have walked there, but I walked there last week and it was very um, scary to know that a public open access could be there because the children all came seconds. down to the fence and they watched us as we walked by. So that's what's gonna happen to the children there. So please reconsider. I know there's a lawsuit, you can't talk about it, but intimate domain is old and it's not, shouldn't be enforced for a bike trail. Thank you.
Good evening. My name is Alexandra Soberer Butler, and I work for the infirm at MCH. We have never ending requests to take more infants. In order to accommodate our growing numbers, a new infant room needed to be built. And because, because of the ongoing suits and our inability to expand on our property, a large portion of the multipurpose room needed to be taken to build the new infant room. This large room is used for nap times, music lessons, dance lessons, festivals, concerts, and parent-teacher events. It is difficult now to coordinate all these activities in the small space. We must also schedule the infant naps and feeding times around many of the activities going on in the multipurpose due to the noise that many um, of these activities produce. This year, six years long case has stunned our ability to expand our building and outdoors play space and accommodate the needs of our community children for Montessori education. For these and many other reasons, we're asking you to reconsider the city use of eminent domain for the past on our property and use with one of the other options you have. I appreciate your time and consideration. The next speaker is Tamina Begum, followed by Elizabeth Brenner. Dear council, sorry. Uh, dear council members, my name is Tahmina Begum and I am a teacher at the Montessori Children's House. Let me first begin by saying thank you for welcoming me and my peers to the room to speak the propose our thoughts on the matters at hand. I would like to pro <clears throat> proceed my starting a few words on behalf of my fellow colleagues. At our school, we host many outdoor activities for our children to truly immerse themselves in the learning environment comfortably with joy and freedom to explore. Privacy and safety are paramount when it comes to the students. Therefore, a fence has been installed outside the school to create a boundary, but is see through to throw so that children can enjoy more of nature. However, by welcoming strangers to walk or bike with the ability to watch over our children would simply render our learning environment as unsafe. As you may know, we in our society are surrounded by many hostile individuals that could inflict harm on others. And we know seconds. that our children would be easy prey. Any individual on the track with the wrong intention could easily climb over the fence and impose harm in the blink and eyes. When it comes to children, adjacent to a stranger on the track, the possibility are endless of what could go wrong. I have to stop now? Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Elizabeth Brenner, and I stand here today very upset and frustrated about the possibility of the city's decision on my son's safety. One of the main reasons we chose Montessori Children's House was the secluded area, a nature-friendly curriculum they have. The proposed bike trail will impose and impact my son's security and limit him to have access to the expansion of the school, where a new classroom and new playground will be constructed in addition to limiting his access to the Creek for Nature lessons. Since the beginning, Ms. Effie had a plan to expand this school. She has worked so hard to continue the expansion, and now that she's ready to do so, she's limited to finishing her dream of providing a safe space for children to grow and learn. In the light of the recent school shootings, it is of extreme importance to think about the extra layers of security we have to have in place to protect our children. And having this trail will increase the traffic footprint extremely close to the school. This easy access to the school will promote and incite predators, vandals, and affect the safety of the staff. Thank you for your time. The next speaker, the next speaker is Kelly Thornburg, followed by Ruth Platt.
Good evening. I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, but I would like to show you, I've got seven little pictures on three pages. Am I allowed to approach you and hand the council members? If you'll just look at, I'll walk you through the pictures really quick. Um, I am an employee of the Montessori Children's House. I wear many hats. The most important one is the safety of the children. Um, I check the playgrounds. You know, I make sure all the fire stuff, that we have an escape route. I do all that. And so now I want to address what's going on with the city and the land. If you look at the first two pictures on that first page, those are the pictures that you've seen in the news. That's, you know, it's taken from a long shot. You can see. Now, if you'll turn to the second page, it shows actually how close that trail is to the children's playground. If you look at the first one top left, you're looking right down where the trail will be. Top right's another, sh another shot of it. If you look the bottom left, you can see where I've shot from one end going seconds. to the other end. The, the next one is, the, is from the other end, and you can see the children are all right there by the fence. So if you turn to the last page, this is me standing on the trail looking up at the children. I just ask you for a moment. I blacked out the faces of those children so that they cannot be seen. I'm asking you to put your children and your grandchildren on the face of those children and see how you would vote. Thank you. Thank you. Also, real quick, please feel free to come by and I'll show you the land. Appreciate it. Right there. Um, my name is Ruth Platt, and I live in East Plano, and I'm also here to protest the rezoning of the residential to multifamily uh, dwelling at Jupiter and Los Rios. Um, I honestly cannot believe that you guys overruled the unanimous planning and zoning committee, which voted eight to zero against this rezoning plan. You went against city policy, which recommended that new multifamily complexes be built as part of mixed use or transit oriented development. Um, you went against city staff, who stated that the zoning was well outside the character of the surrounding environment. You went against the Plano Comprehensive Plan, which was just approved less than a year ago and limited multifamily apartments in the area to less than 20%. And you also went against the Plano Zoning Ordinance, which specifies that apartments be located at major intersections, and went against the 550 plus people in that area that was opposed to the rezoning. All that you guys voted against. Crazy. But the worst thing you did for the city of Plano was that your vote set a precedence. If you can vote against this zoning change, which had all these red flags, there is not another zoning change that you guys can ever vote against. If a developer wants to change the zoning of a piece of land in Plano, all they have to do is tell the seconds. city of Plano that they are planning to sue. Inappropriate use, city of Plano doesn't care. Goes against Plano comprehensive plan, doesn't matter. Just an imaginary lawsuit, okay, let's do it. But talking about lawsuits, do you not remember the half a million dollars the city spent on outside lawyers and legal fee fees to defend the Plano T Tomorrow Plan, which was ultimately repealed and replaced with the Plano Comprehensive Plan? The Plano Comprehensive Plan that does not allow apartments to be built in this location, which you violated with this zoning change. So disappointed. The next speaker is Arifa Rahman, followed by Kate Okiyama. Good evening. My name is Arifa Rahman, and I work at MCH. I am here to address two problems that will be imposed on the school in our land is taken by eminent domain to connect a six city bicycle trail. First off, even now we have a shortage in the space in our parking lot, especially during pickup, drop-off, and school-wide special events. We are depending on our phase two expansion to add currently needed parking spaces, as well as the spaces required for the new phase two building. If our land is taken to be used as a trail, this new parking, this new parking lot would be impacted. 
The second, and most important, is the safety of not only our children, but our staff and visitors. Our school has a diverse group of students and employees. We see that as a positive, but not everyone does. As you have seen, for example, by the arrest of Esmeralda Upton due to the racist rant here in the Plano last August. All of our students are under, age, um, under the age of 10 and are at a vulnerable age stage of life. Because of their age and eagerness to learn and to engage with others, they could be easily targeted. With the proposed trail being located in our backyard, our children could be easy prey for predator hiding in the wood areas behind the trail. This is a big risk. 20 seconds. We at MCH extra measure to ensure the safety of our children in case of weather issues, firebomb threats, and intruders. If our land is taken, we'll have the, uh, we'll have the added burden of uh, increased risk of expo exposure of our campus to predators. Please join us in doing what is right for our school and our children. We are asking for you to consider our option you already have in hand for the placement of the trail. Thank you so very much. I'm actually following up as well with the bike trail and the Montessori Children's Home. To give you guys some context, I am a Plano resident, but I'm actually a transplant. So I'm one of those millions of people that have moved to Texas, and I am not against, we're not against the development of Plano. I grew up in Scottsdale, Arizona. I love what it's done with the city. I was just in Seattle, saw a lot of transformation there. I want the city to develop with a bike trail, with active lifestyle, our lifestyle, that is something we want. But what we don't want is to expose our children to the unsafetiness of bringing that bike trail right by the playground, right by the school. We have so many issues right now. We already have so much trouble keeping our children safe within schools, within different daycares, that why would we open up that door? That does not make sense to me. It does not make sense to our school. I can let all the others address on the space issues, on the amount of lack of lack of space and being full for others to accommodate. I mean, I was during COVID, I had my uh, infant from two weeks old until she was 10 months at my house with my husband and myself working full-time. It's not feasible. You do need daycare, but that's not my issue. My issue is the safety. Bringing that, I live right on a bike trail, uh, and I loved it. I ran every day. I was very active, but best believe I was not on that trail after dark or in, early, in the early morning, and I was never by myself. I always had my dog, and that's because the people that I saw on the bike trail, you see all walks of life, which is great, and that's the beauty of it, but you don't want that coming so close to your children. I have a two-year-old and a seventh-month-old in the school right now, and my daughter comes home every day with grass in her hair, and I love it because that means she's carefree, outside playing, enjoying life, and so I want that to continue. Thank you. The next speaker is Anoshi. Asif, followed by Yun Chen Chen. <clears throat> Thank you for listening to me. I am Anusha Asif, and my four year, my almost four year old, goes to MCH. When I leave him at school in the morning, I feel so confident that he is in such great hands. I feel like the environment that he's in is secure. And like, you know, most of you might have children. And security is, the, is I feel, the most important thing for me right now for my kids. And with the ongoing situation, as a mother, I just feel concerned like other parents that if the piece of land, the preschool land, is taken away for the bicycle trail, I feel that there are two reasons that it should not be done this way. A, with all due respect, and I really mean it with all due respect, the Texas gun laws, it just makes me feel very, very uncomfortable. I just feel that there could be predators and strangers close by, and I just feel very, very unsafe sending my school, uh, kids to school this way. And the other thing is that I feel that Mrs. Safi has done so much for our kids. She has given them such excellent seconds. facilities. And my, my kid had a little bit of a speech delay. He is blooming now. And I don't want to pick him up from school thinking that, you know, I might not send him tomorrow because, you know, there's a bike trail. And I just feel that the prestigious school is there for the kids and the kids really treated 
as a, their second home. We don't want to take a piece of their home away from them. So please, please help Mrs. Effie and not take away the piece of land that there is for MCH. Thank you so much. Good evening, my name is Yuchong Chen Miller. My, um, my husband and I, we moved to Plano from Irving last year to raise our family. I was six months pregnant back then. And my daughter, she uh, enrolled in to Mount Montessori Children's House when she was five months old, and now she's 14 months old. She graduated from the Hummingbird class, and now she's in Blue Jay class now. And I'm here, and you probably guys, I'm here for the Montessori Children's House bike trail. I, I know a lot of us have already talked about all the safety issues, and as a mother, as a mother here, um, I'm really nervous, and I kept crying whenever I heard other people talk about it. It's hard for me to Im imagine my kids being in that playground, and they're saying hello to whoever the stranger is that's riding across the bike trail, and that stranger could hurt them. And I know they love playing there, and my, my baby Cora, she, um, she always comes home really happy, and I know she's in safe hands. All of the, um, the staff, they're, they're, they're all female, they're all really nice, but it just breaks my heart to think that if the city builds a back trail there, there, there could be the possibility that that would no longer be the case. Seconds. And since then, I've introduced my friends to bring their kids there as well, and I know the, the children's house, they survived COVID. They, they had only one kid remaining during COVID. And it's a small business of Miss Effie. She's, she's a nice old lady. I don't know where she is. It's, this meeting's been too long for her, I guess. But I don't care about what STR is, but I really care about my kids' safety, so please listen to us. Thank you. The next speaker is Isosa... Omar Rochemoa, one, I'm sorry, and Miriam Seiki following. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Esus Amoritema. I am a Nigerian, and I came to United States in 2015. I got married to my beautiful wife, and we have three daughters. Sometime in 2020, we started looking for a very good place to take our kids to, because um, in the United States, when you don't have families around here and you have little kids, and you are a full-time employee, becomes a problem for you to take care of those kids. We eventually found a place that we think was very good, and they're still there, we're happy with the location, and suddenly we're getting the information that a bicycle tray is going to be located very close to this space. And that is a very big concern for me, for the safety of my little girls. I, I work as an agilist for one of the biggest banks in America, and my major focus in my place of work is to prevent problems. And I just want everybody to start thinking in that line. Why do we allow kids to be exposed to danger? And when something happens, we all come together to mourn. We all come together to say we're sorry. We all come together to talk about condolences. I just can't imagine such thing being located to this place, knowing that these kids are going to be exposed to a problem. I can't imagine that happening, 15. and I just want to plead with everyone here, if we allow everybody that want to come speak for the Montessori Children's House to come here, we're going to have more than a 1,000. Because my wife's parents are willing to come all the way from Massachusetts to come here to come plead with you all to please let these kids have privacy and let the environment be good for them to learn. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Miriam Safi. So the previous council, and some of you are included, have heard a lot from, from us and our representatives. Um, my mother is Effie Safi. She started Montessori Children's House. Is her dream, educating children with passion, with love, care, and concern. And please just visit this school. You've heard so much from us, and yet here we are again. We really need some action to be taken in our favor. Um, She's been a tax-paying citizen for so many years, 20 years. This school is thriving. Parents are coming. You know, they're, they're leaving their children at home to come here and speak before you today. Please do the right thing. We really invite you to come see this school. If you, don't, if you are, haven't already, some of you may have. 
Um, she's really tried so hard to work with everybody, with the city, and we really would just love for everybody to think about the implications, the consequences of decisions, of actions for current and future residents, students, and for Effie and the school and for everyone involved. Thank you. The next speaker is Sabine Hader, followed by Daryl Rodenbaugh. Good evening. My name is Sabine Hyder, and I'm a teacher at Montessori Children's House. I'm representing uh, Brittany Haley, who could not attend today because of um, illness. Uh, my name is Brittany Haley, and I'm a Plano resident and a Plano-based business owner. My two sons have attended Montessori Children's House for many years. The amount of care and love that Miss Effie and her wonderful staff put into the school is Im immeasurable. I'm shocked and deeply concerned that the city of Plano would prioritize a bike path over children's safety and well-being, let alone the viability of a small business owner that has given so much to the community and to so many children of Plano and beyond. How are you uh, going to take care of security for the school? Lighting, fences, 24-hour security guards. It would be irresponsible to put this added burden on the school. What are your plans in case one of the children are attacked or abducted? Will the school or the city be liable? Who is liable if a bicyclist or a walker gets hurt on the path by the school? This privately owned uh, land is questioned, uh, in, in question serves to the future growth of the school, but beyond that, who would want a connecting bike path where any stranger can be right against school property? For a bike path trail connector, why not build, why not just build it on another piece of land? This beautiful, this beautiful piece of land that was purchased decades ago would be better served as intended by owners. More classrooms, a sport field, or an outdoor shaded playground, a water park, or an extended parking lot. Thank you, Brittany Haley, owner of West Construction Group. Good evening. Um, my name is Daryl Rodenbaum. I'm a proud Plano resident, uh, and I volunteer as CEO for the North Texas Performing Arts, formerly the Plano Children's Theater. I'm actually here to thank the Plano Cultural Affairs Commission, the City Council, and the citizens of Plano for the generous support for the arts. We work with almost a dozen municipalities across North Texas, and I'm proud to report that the City of Excellence offers one of the most progressive and supportive arts environments in this region, and through a best-in-class, fair, and objective grant process, allocates its hotel and hotel tax funds better than anyone else in the region. Through your support, last year we brought over 350,000 visitors to Plano Bay stages, and Plano is known coast to coast as home of the largest youth theater in the country, enabling over 10,000 children the opportunity to experience the performing arts in 180 major production and 1,500 performances on a dozen stages, bringing in audiences from across North Texas, from Dallas, Frisco, and beyond to Plano stages. This weekend at our annual Stardust Awards, we'll be recognizing the artist of the year, maestro Hector Guzman and, uh, uh, from the Plano Symphony Orchestra. We'll also be recognizing Plano ISD's Greg Arp as distinguished arts leader and Plano teachers Carmen McElwin of Shepton High School and Joshua Batty of Armstrong seconds. Middle School. It is our honor to also recognize the Shops of Willow Bend and HB, HEB for the philanthropic support for the arts. In all, some 80 honorees from hundreds of nominees in 20 different categories, including artists, leaders, and volunteers will be recognized for their impact and support of the arts, and all that is possible because of your support. Thank you. The next speaker is Jean Gervaisi, and following Jean will be Jazz Alexander, who was supposed to be on Zoom, but I'm not sure if he I'm in. you came in. Okay. Mr. Mayor, City Council, thank you for giving us the opportunity here. My heart is broken as a parent 
Anytime I hear a kid getting killed or being abused in any way, most of you guys know me, and I don't play that game. The situation is here with this school, with these kids, these wonderful people that have been running the school for so many years. We're going to put a bike trail there. So much property. There's so much property there. You can put trails all around. I'm a bike rider myself. I enjoyed it. But this city has got to do the right thing for these people and for our children. Politics is about making projects for each other. Making politics is, is getting in the way of our children. I beg you, all of you, please do the right thing for Ms. Effie and our children. Thank you. Happy Columbus Day. Uh, I'm Jazz Alexander. Uh, I live in Timberbrook Estates. Um, here to touch on a couple of things, uh, like Plano, we're the city of excellence, and um, due diligence needs to be done in every zoning case, as we see in Arlington, zoning matters. Uh, it can work in our favor. Uh, but for the Los Rios, the nature preserve, it seems like y'all are imminent domain in the wrong place, the school, and not this place, where there's nothing, and we could possibly build a bike trail. But we have to be more creative in our thought. Don't think that we can't fall from the city of excellence to the city of fear, or anything of that nature because uh, my real estate background is showing 32% of people moving out of Dallas County and they're coming here. And we just have to keep doing excellent things to stay excellent. So I think that's why you see all the people of excellence here and don't think that you should fear any outsider but fear the people of excellence because they what make the city. And then I would say to city council, you know, you're up there because you were voted up there. Go with what your gut is. Because on your voting record, your emotions are not going to show up. And that's all I can say. Y'all have a great day. The last speaker this evening will be Asad Rizvi. Asad? Yes, okay. Oh. Sorry. Didn't see. I'm actually really impressed with the level of passion in the residents and constituents of Plano, uh, privileged to be in this community. I'm a resident of Lakeside on Preston. That's a uh, subdivision west of uh, Preston. And I think it's a little bit hypocritical or ironic discussing all these issues such as noise pollution and safety of its residents and constituents when a 100,000 square foot building with a thousand parking spaces and concession after concession to HEB has been made without the interest or of its citizens and anything of that nature. Back oh, just a little bit. Thanks. Yeah, sorry. And so, I mean, this is a residence. Oh, is it too close, yeah. sir? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I apologize. We, we can hear you. Uh, okay, it was my first. Uh, so I, it's ironic. I don't think there's anything, you know, uh, dealing with, I lost my train of tra thought. Um, but I just feel that, you know, the, the city of Plano, the approval process, the different art from architect to city development to, does not reflect the ethos of Lakeside, does not reflect the culture of Lakeside, the residents of Lakeside. Essentially, we are bringing 100,000 individuals into my back neighborhood that is about a $1.4 million medium house. Um, uh, housing uh, price with a uh, 250,000 median income, which is not a concern, but all our property taxes are not being reflected for our own residents, and yet concession after concession is being made for HEB and these multi-million dollar businesses. And it's unfortunate that uh, the city of Plano is not putting the interests of its citizens or constituents at hand. Um, the last thing I just would say is just a little bit hypocritical to discuss for four hours or about noise pollution and yet allow a zoning of commercial areas into high, it doesn't matter what level income, into residents and then say, oh, well, there's noise pollution. There absolutely is going to be these issues when this is allowed. And that's all I have to say. Sorry about that, about the noise, but thank you. Mr. Mayor. Mayor. Um, Mayor, I'm um, sorry. There were two speakers that had signed up oh, in another area okay. that meant sorry. to do this, so I've got two more. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, so Dale Buchanan and then M. Springer will follow, and that will be the last two. Okay. Apologize. Hello, I'm Dale Buchanan. 
I've been a Plano resident since 1982. I live at 3009 Morton Vale Road with my wife and family. Uh, we live adjacent to the Los Rios multifamily project. So we are ones that have been greatly affected and I have had yet to have anyone from the city reach out to ask anything to make this more palatable to us. It uh, seems very unfortunate that uh, you've all been able to be strong-armed by politics, by threat of lawsuit or whatever it is to not do what the city residents have asked you to do. Because that's what we're looking for. So I'm deeply disappointed. So thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for uh, letting me speak today. My name is M. Springer. I'm a Plano resident and I have been for about 15 years. Um, I've always loved to live here. One of the things I wanted to do is raise my family here. Um, I actually own a home in Timberbrook, so the Plano Los Rios thing is very vital to me. However, my children go to Montessori Children's House, which is way more important. So I gotta choose this talk on one, I only get one, you know, my 1.5. Choosing a school was no easy task. I evaluated everything from the student-teacher ratio all the way to a Google review and asking friends. The most important thing is that my children were safe. I have that with Miss Effie and MCH. The school is situated away from traffic, public footpaths, and allows me the peace of mind as a parent that when I drop off my twins, I know they're good. The people that own this property and the school have done immeasurable good for the youth and in the community where they are. They've been there for more than 30 years. They own the property. There have been articles written, petitions signed, websites and their support, and on and on. I know you're kind of tired, but seconds. so are we. <laughs> we just want to make sure that the school stays intact and that the children have an opportunity to learn in a beautiful environment. So I implore the members of this group, Plano City Council, please work to find a route alternative for the bike path. And if at all possible, throw in there to get rid of the multifamily development at Jupiter and Los Rios. <laughs> I think that the homeowners there might appreciate that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for my time. Mayor and City Council, as you know, we have been involved in this uh, litigation with the Montessori School for many years now. and. Um, we have made numerous attempts and we've released a statement in the past to settle this claim with the property owner, Ms. Safey, and at least one of those past authors has also included paying her some money and dropping the case and not building the trail behind her school, and she has rejected the offers. Um, the case is going to trial in two, in two weeks, and so, and actually Mr. Abernathy's representing us, but anybody that wants the statements that we've released publicly, I don't have them here. One of the challenges of trying to settle this case is I think this property was appraised a little over $25,000 um, by the city's appraisal expert. Uh, the commissioners who initially heard this case is on appeal now um, awarded her somewhere in that range and she says her property's worth $2 million and she has no appraisal expert that will testify it, on, that's going to be testifying at the trial about that. So it's very hard when somebody's asking us for $2 million for a $25,000 piece of property. And it, it became so cumbersome, the litigation and all the challenges, that we at one time did say, we will walk away from this and pay you. So it was within her control. She rejected that. And we've spent so much money and come so far and collected other pieces to build the trail at this point that the plan now is just to proceed with the litigation. We actually offered to settle a few weeks ago and that was rejected too. So um, anybody that would like to hear our public state, to have the public statements we've made on that, we can release them if they ask. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. It's not about the money. Everybody who spoke and uh, people who have spoken previously, I understand you're very concerned about the safety issues which you've been told about. 
I want to point out that the exact same circumstances that people have voiced concerns about already exist and have for many years at Hedgecoke Elementary, 1,700 feet away. The exact same bike trail that already is built runs right by the playground Please. of Hedgecoke Elementary and is abutted by the exact same line of trees that uh, would stand behind the finish trail today. Anybody's welcome to go out there and see for yourself. Ma'am, please. To my knowledge, there have been zero safety concerns in all these years by Hedgecoke Elementary. Guys, guys, this is, this is not on the agenda. This is, this is for comments of public in this, please. Please, this is, this is a meeting for the city council. We've allowed you to speak. We're gonna move on to the consent agenda. Thank you. The consent agenda. The consent agenda will be acted upon in one motion. <coughs> Excuse me. It contains items which are routine and typically non-controversial. Items may be removed from this agenda for individual discussion by a council member, the city manager, or any citizen. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests. And Mr. Mayor, if I may, I'd like to remove item N. N? N, yeah. Okay. And item H, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so yeah, either one. <laughs> so item H and item N have been uh, removed. H and N. Okay. Make a motion to uh, pass the consent agenda as written, excluding item H and N, as in Hilo in November. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item H and item N. Please vote. <laughs> All right. Motion passes eight to zero. Uh, item H, Lisa. Item H, to approve an expenditure for engineering professional services for sewer improvements, Indian Creek, Frito Lay, White Rock Creek, Evans Park, Spring Creek, Shawnee Park, and Laurel Lane. Project number 7567 in the amount of $590,100 from Lockwood, Andrews, and Newman, in Inc. for the engineering department and authorizing the city manager to execute all necessary documents. Could, could those of you that are, that are in the back Please stop talking publicly because we can hear everybody. I'd appreciate it. Mayor and Council, I'm Jack Carr, Deputy City Manager, here to answer any questions you may have about uh, item H. Yeah, thank you, Jack. Um, looking at this, and when I looked at the location map, um, one of the questions that leapt out to me, uh, given that the uh, purpose expressed in the agenda item was to um, reduce or eliminate odors caused by added flows to the system was what are we planning for the areas near the Rowlett Creek plant? That's been a subject of uh, recurring concern, the odors. So, a real good question. If you look at the map, it, it is kind of strange. Um, what we did is a uh, sanitary sewer evaluation study, identified locations where we had inflow and infiltrations, problems with the pipes. Aerial crossings, points where uh, sewer lines went under uh, gabion walls, and some, some big issues. Some of those locations where the, the sanitary sewers leaking out created odor issues. So that's the odor that we're talking about in that. The capacity issues that are resolved by this project is to eliminate the inflow and infiltration. And for uh, just a recollection, that's where water, rainwater, creek water gets into the sanitary sewer during a rain event and takes away the capacity of that downstream sewer. And so what this will do is we can seal up those holes and restore that capacity. We're not adding additional piping. We're not increasing the size of it. We're restoring um, that, uh, the, the integrity of the pipe at seven different locations. Okay, in the first paragraph of the agenda item, it said the project includes design and construction of 27, 24, 21, 18, 15, and 12 inch sanitary sewer lines. So are, are we using those gauges, if you will, of pipe to patch, or are we actually building lines? Gabion's at one location. If you read on, it's uh, at uh, White Rock Creek, Indian Creek, Evans 
Park, uh, Spring Creek, Prito Lake Camp, it's respectively, right. respectively. <clears throat> so each one of those locations has a different pipe yeah. size. So we're not. Well, not, I mean, we're using all of those at uh, one single location, but I mean, that suggests to me that we are building additional pipe. It's repairing pipe at each one of those locations, those different okay. sizes. Okay. Um, because, um, because the area around the Los Rios plant is such a um, recurring concern, and several of us have been out there and smelled for ourselves, that is correct. Um, <clears throat> as has been discussed on this dais before, can you tell me where uh, repairs or extensions or additions are planned in that area? Because I understand that they don't have any additional capacity and um, that additional inflows are being rerouted. Um, but, uh, but it seems to me that based on our previous discussions around this for years, I guess, um, a lot of the odor issues coming from around there are because of capacity constraints. Okay. And again, the I and I, the inflow infiltration is caused by a hole in the pipe. It's an integrity issue. You, you uh, seal up that hole in the pipe, the, the rainwater, the groundwater doesn't get in there. We're not rerouting the, the I and I, we're just sealing it off. No, I, so. underst I understand that. My question is, um, <clears throat> I understand we, we're not yeah. adding flow. We don't want to add additional flows to, um, to the Rowlett Creek treatment plant, but it seems to me we do want to alleviate some of the existing capacity that's heading to the plant by some of the same things you're discussing doing here at the other locations, plugging it up so there's not as much infiltration. Right. And uh, so un understanding it's not on this agenda item, is there anything planned for our lines around that area that so might our, help? Excuse me. Uh, our director of public works is reaching out to some of the citizens in that general area at the, uh, the Rowlett uh, Creek Regional Water uh, Wastewater Treatment Plant and working with them on odor issues, uh, doing odor studies with sensors in that area, trying to identify where those odors are coming from. Uh, a lot of the things that they've identified in the past is where um, manholes and vault covers have been um, slid open and, and left open, allowing that odor to come out. Again, uh, with those odor sensors out there, they'll be able to identify the source of the odors and work on that. This in particular is those seven locations that will reduce the amount of flow that's reaching the plant and thereby reduce the, um, that load on the plant. So there is some benefit at the uh, Rowlett plant from these projects, but not a, a specific location of a point repair at that location. Okay. Oh, th thank you, Mayor. I just had a quick question for uh, Mr. Carr. So, uh, Jack, th there was a concern raised given the capacity issues at the Rowlett uh, wastewater treatment plant already that this project might increase inflow to the plant, but uh, I received the, the staff response on that issue that um, that this will just be repairing existing sewer lines and that actually uh, uh, upon completion of the project there will be less flow reaching the treatment plant. So I just wanted to point that out. That's correct, right? That is exactly what I've been trying to say. Fantastic. Well, I, I just wanted to, to, you know, confirm that and, you know, put that on the record. So th thank you, Jack. For you that, that said great it so well. So, well, <laughs> thank you. you, you I was reading what uh, what, what uh, either you or, or, or perhaps uh, uh, Caleb or somebody else wrote. So. <laughs> so, so, so you're the one who said it well. But yeah, anyway, thank, thank you. you. Any Mo other questions? Motion to approve item H. Uh, second. second. Uh, Thanks. I have a, a motion and a second to approve item H on the consent agenda. Please vote. Motion passes. Eight zero. Um, with this discussion, I think this is a good time to ask for an item for a future agenda to review our medium to long term plan for sewer maintenance. For Rowlett. No. Well, I, I'd, I'd like the whole city, but, yeah. okay. but I'd like it to include Rowlett. Yeah, well, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, item N. Item N to approve the carry for, carrying forward of a certain of certain fiscal year 2021-22 funds to fiscal year 2022-23 and providing an effective date. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, I pulled this item. Uh, uh, I reviewed the list of carry forwards in the consent agenda and uh, identified four that it did not seem uh, obvious that they were that they were carry forwards as opposed to 
um, new appropriations, you know, kind of first time appropriations. I've exchanged emails with city manager Israel sent about this and, and greatly appreciate the information that, uh, that he and the staff have provided. With the further information, three of the four uh, do seem to be carry forwards, but one is still uh, unclear to me. Uh, so I, I pulled this to uh, discuss that one. It's the, uh, the uh, uh, $36,000 expenditure for, um, for the workstation reconfiguration for neighborhood services. I want to be very clear that it seems like a worthwhile expenditure. It's related to uh, the two additional employees that were added on, uh, 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 you know, after the other uh, employees were, were kind of uh, planned for. And, uh, uh, but it, it nonetheless seems like a new first time appropriation rather than an actual carry forward. Um, so I just wanted to uh, understand this better uh, before voting on it as a carry forward. So thank Again, you. Again, Jack Carr, Deputy City Manager. On that uh, particular item, we have the Neighborhood Services Department. Uh, it's a, uh, a facility that has a cubicle type uh, um, office layout. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that, when we add uh, two more staff members, we'll need to actually move around and, and change size of a, a lot of that uh, modular furniture. About two months ago, we talked about uh, adding two more staff members for the short-term rental. Uh, we have uh, a need to, to move on it fairly fast. Our staff identified some uh, funds that were freed up from professional services. They took those funds and actually moved it into that instead of waiting for the monies that uh, this body was going to provide starting October 1. We got a two month head start on it by doing it this way. Um, it's, it's whether okay. just fund it with the same general fund two months ago or start a week ago on the same project. So, and we took the opportunity to actually go ahead and start to actually approve that. Uh, Karen can probably talk about the two different process. One is going through the carry forward process, which is to add it to this list. And you guys say yes to the overall list, or there's probably a lot longer process to actually go through and make a change to add the $36,000 in a different way. Uh, you know, really the, the crux of my question was just, as I understand it, carry forwards are for items that have already been budgeted and approved, but were not completed typically due to delays or other constraints in the previous fiscal year. And so we carry forward to the next fiscal year. And th this one, I don't, I, I could be misunderstanding, but it didn't sound like it had been previously budgeted or approved that it was a yes. new item. Oh. I'm uh, Karen Rhodes Whitley, budget director. During the process, when we found out that those other people were going to be added, we physically budget adjusted and moved the money within the reestimate. So the, when was it? September 11th, the city council approved the reestimate as the adopted budget for 21-22. So those carry forwards are like they were budgeted and they're going into the next year. So they physically have been moved and included in the reestimate. <clears throat> In addition, I know on one of your questions I saw earlier today, the technology services. Yes. That also, they had savings. We physically moved that money into a project code to be used for the other item, Salesforce. Now, technology services is totally different than the general fund. The general fund sure. is completely appropriated when you adopt the budget. Our TS fund is an internal service fund. So technically, at the end of the day, if for some reason y'all decide not to do that one, we will just come back and we can do a supplemental appropriation to move that money. Okay. But the one uh, that Jack just talked about, those monies, and TS has too, have been physically put over there and it was approved during the 21-22 reestimate Process. Okay, well, thank you. If, if that's already okay. been budgeted and approved in the prior fiscal yeah, year, it's totally I, moved. it could, could have been my misunderstanding. It wasn't clear to me from the earlier emails, but I, I appreciate that that information. With, with that information, it does sound like a, like okay. a carry forward, so I'll, I'll move to approve item N. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and second to approve item N on the consent agenda. Please vote. Yeah, th thank you for that additional information. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Motion passes eight to zero. We're going to take a five minute recess and we'll start on item number five.
City Council is reconvened into open session. All council members are present. Move on to items of individual consideration. Public hearing items. Applicants are limited to 15 minutes presentation time with a five minute rebuttal if needed. Remaining speakers are limited to 30 total minutes of testimony time with three minutes assigned per speaker. The presiding officer may amend these times as deemed necessary. Non-public hearing items. The presiding officer will permit public comment for items on the agenda not posted for a public hearing. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests, the length of the agenda, and to ensure meeting efficiency and may include a cumulative time limit. Speakers will be called in the order the requests are received until the cumulative time is exhausted. And we're going to begin with item number five, comments, discussion, and direction regarding short-term rentals. Thank you. I remind everybody that's uh, registered, registered to speak. It'll be a, a minute and a half for everybody. So go ahead. Let's start. All right. Our first speaker is Bill France, followed by Suzanne Pappas. Good evening. Tonight you have heard one legal opinion on why you should allow short-term rentals to operate in our neighborhoods. Now you will hear a few opinions of why you should not. I ask all of our supporters to please stand. On May 20th, we asked City Council to review the Arlington Ordinance and answer one simple question. Why won't this work in Plano? What I heard tonight is yes, it might. Two points. First, our zoning law is clear. Every type of transient lodging is prohibited, and any other assertion of the intent of that law is an intentional attempt to circumvent the truth. Second, to allow this type of lodging to exist in our neighborhoods harbors criminal activity, intentional or not. And we are not too confident that criminals are planning to comply with any registration program. The city recently spent a million dollars on a new fire truck. 20 seconds. My house may never catch fire, but I'm sure glad you did. Tonight, you will hear that our city is on fire. And in my opinion, If we need to spend a million dollars in court to fight this fire, then I think a few folks here tonight would agree. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Suzanne Pappas and I've been a resident of Plano for over 20 years. I live in Forest Creek Estates, a platinum neighborhood with a very active voluntary HOA and a women's club with over 100 members. As this org chart from the city of website suggests, we as Plano citizens act as the CEO to the mayor and city council. As CEOs, we previously considered our decision of living in Plano, choosing our neighborhoods, and making substantial investments into our properties, all solid decisions. This was based on the knowledge that the mayor and the city council took direction from its residents, were responsible for how the city runs, were putting zoning ordinances in place, et cetera, all with the residents at the best interest, their best interests in mind. The city's decision to consider, to not consider SDRs as hotels when it comes to zoning yet consider them as hotels when it comes to taxes by collecting the hotel occupancy tax is really unacceptable. We as CEOs of the city implored you to do what you were voted to do when we voted you into office, and that is to protect our city and our neighborhoods. If you seconds. have not personally experienced a nightmare of an STR, it's only a matter of time. Short-term rentals are growing exponentially. I have one in my street, which was shocking to me. There are no background checks, no validation of credentials. They are in every zip code in the city, including all of your neighborhoods. Some as close as a few hundred feet from your homes. I implore you to act now and 
enforce or redefine the zoning ordinances that were put in place for this very reason. Do you really want a brothel next door? Is that a neighborhood you want to live in, invest in, and represent as, as a government official? I, I tell you, you don't. Thank you. The next speaker is John Burke, followed by Christy Davidson. Good evening. My name is John Burke, and I'm, uh, I live here in Plano for 29 years. Now, you've heard from me before in these council meetings. Thanks for your work on the council. I live two houses away from a problematic STR, a short-term rental. And I see it as a clear violation of the ordinances that were in place when we moved here. I expect our council to act on behalf of the citizens, and I urge you to be led more by a sense of community welfare than by a fear of litigation and selective precedence. I expect the council to focus on solutions like Arlington's zoning solutions foremost and the beefing up of ordinances that was said earlier as secondary, important, but not primary. Beefing up of ordinances, in my opinion, is really placing the burden on the citizens to police and report at risk of having vagrants or, or transients maybe retaliate against them. Many, many residents hesitate to do that. I expect the city council to refine and fortify the language of our current ordinances to reflect the original protective intent of the ordinance and abandon its middle ground stance of suggesting that the language of the existing ordinance is clear enough to justify the continued collection of a hotel tax and STRs, yet not clear enough to enforce restriction of operation in our residential neighborhoods. 20 seconds. I expect you to stand unified with your citizens and unequivocally declare that prohibiting STRs in planner residential neighborhoods absolutely does advance the public purpose by ensuring safety, wholesome fabric for our neighborhoods. Use our tax dollars to, pre to prepare a robust uh, law case and stand up to the potential threat of lawsuits from those currently in violation of the spirit of our ordinances. Thank you for your work. Thank, Thank you. you. I think it's still Monday, I don't know. Um, my name is Christy Davidson. I've lived in Plano for 35 years, the last 21 on a beautiful cul-de-sac with great neighbors. About a year ago, a man from out of state bought the home next to me and promptly opened a hotel. I'm not gonna call it the innocent acronym STR, VRBO. It is most definitely a hotel. Since the home is very large and the daily rate is $1,100, I'm going to give you a sampling of what we get. Multiple families at once, like the five families that are staying there right now as we speak. Huge bachelor parties, bachelorette parties. A semi-pro hockey team from Oregon, all 23 of them. Uh, a group of 20-somethings all driving really expensive cars, dragging nitrous tanks, accompanied by kids coming and going all weekend with the blinds shut, drug activity, yeah, probably. And finally, as of three weeks ago, what appeared to be a weekend brothel, complete with naked women, cars lining the streets, filled with men, all witnessed by our neighbors. We start each week wondering, what is it gonna be this week? And I'm left with two questions. Why does a man from out of state, whose kids will never go to our schools, he won't live in that house, have more rights than I do? And why do I feel like I'm fighting the very people I voted for to represent me and keep our neighborhood safe and Plano a desirable place to live? And one last note, this house is booked for the entire week of Halloween. And we do have trick-or-treaters. And parents, please beware. I, <laughs> from what I've seen, I don't know if I'd want my kids trick-or-treating. Thank you. The next speaker is Mike Leiser, followed by Maria Bauer. My name is Mike Leiser, and I've lived in Plano since 1989, or over 33 years now. I've lived in our 
360 home neighborhood. That's where I live right now, Forest Creek Estates, since 2006. Uh, I'm president of our HOA, but tonight I'm not here speaking as president of our HOA, but instead as a member of our neighborhood that's concerned about this STR issue. Uh, clearly, as we've heard tonight, this is a complex issue. But let me simplify it. I'd like to ask you a rhetorical question. Given all the concerns we've heard, we just had a great testimony. How many of you would be comfortable, perfectly comfortable, with a short-term rental moving into you, you, next door to you? I know that if I ask you to raise your hand, I'd be willing to bet nobody would raise their hand. Who wants that? They ask the same question out here. Not just these folks, but anywhere. Nobody wants that. Clearly, this is an issue that, that unifies all of us. And I know there's difficulties and challenges, but something, surely something can be done. So my message here tonight is please do the right thing. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Find a solution that would make you feel the most comfortable with that where you would have to live next door to it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Maria Bauer. My husband and I are both Navy veterans. We chose Plano to raise our family and bought in a zoned residential neighborhood. But I feel like asking tonight, is there anybody that uh, owns an STR that wants to buy my house for cash? Because you seem to have more rights than I do as a Navy veteran owning my home. I'm not taking this out on the city. I know that you, no one here in their right mind wanted this, okay? We all, I, believe me, I know that. But somehow, somebody let the first zone residential neighborhood decide it, wasn't, it was mixed use, and we didn't have a say in it, okay? We now live three houses down from an STR turned motel. I don't like to call it hotel. It's a motel. The STR is located entryway to two neighborhoods. The only thing separating this house of prostitution, drugs, and five trash cans overflowing with liquor bottles with 25 out-of-state cars in Mexico on any given afternoon from pregnant moms with strollers, eight-year-olds on bikes, and the school bus stop is the curb, okay? When there were 30 men and five naked women in the backyard pool, multiple days with women being assisted in the cars under the influence, our neighbors had zero clue. It was like a gang descended on our neighborhood. These neighbors had no clue because their original single family family home zoning, it no longer existed. We, no one even knows this. 20 okay? seconds. With the city getting a hotel tax on a motel with no front desk and no security. Okay? Don't allow yourself to be bullied. The United States would not be the United States if we allowed ourselves to be bullied. Okay? Plano has money. We can fight a lawsuit. Okay? Registration's a joke. Dallas has 20% registered. Don't kid yourself. STR owners are out of state. Okay, so this idea of registration is a joke. Other Texas cities have figured it out. We can too. Please do something before we lose more neighbors or worse. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Bill Baker, followed by Alina Burke. Mayor Munns, City Council, I'm back. My wife and I moved here 41 years ago. I've seen a lot of changes, and the ones I'm seeing lately are very disturbing. I do not want short rentals in my city, if to be clear. What occurred on Las Palmas last month was horrendous. Thank God I didn't live next door. I hope you hope you never find one next door. But I'm sure there's going to be another one pop up before you know it. The city doesn't need that bad press. I'm embarrassed. This business model creates the perfect environment for Plano for illegal activity. No one knows who are in these homes. I can rent one. I give them my name, I give them a credit card number, they're happy. They have no idea what the other 14 people that I have invited seconds. to my party are about or where they came from. That puts me and my neighbors at risk. Who should be accountable? The property owner, the host, the guest, the city, the platform company? 
That same company in the real estate industry and investors are making millions at the expense of my neighborhood. It will cause irreparable damage to the sheer fabric of our neighborhoods. They break it down. They don't enhance it. Mr. Baker, 10 seconds to wrap it up. I expect you to help us fix this problem and ask for our help, and we'll help you. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Hi, my name is Elena Burke. Good evening, Mayor and Council and all my neighbors. Um, my name is Elena Burke. I've lived in my Plano home for 29 years. I love my home, my neighbors, my neighborhood. Um, what I'm going to read to you tonight is just some headlines regarding um, short-term rentals. Fox News 2020, teen girl shot during party taking place in a short-term rental in Esquite, Texas. June 2021, Airbnb is spending millions of dollars to, quote, make nightmares go away, including payment of $7 million to a woman raped in a New York City short-term rental. Chicago police found 20 illegal guns and 200 people filming a music video in a short-term rental in February 2020. Fox News, California woman rents Michigan Airbnb to have sexual liaison with a 14-year-old boy. WFAA DFW, 80% of Dallas residents do not want to live next to a short-term rental. Short-term renters have no stake in the community. CBS 2019, Plano House Party shooting highlights neighbors' concerns about short-term rental owned by a commercial company. ABC News 20 2022, three teens shot during a homecoming party at a short-term rental in Katy, Texas. There were upwards of 200 teens at the home. Arizona Central, short-term rental shooting adds fuel to Airbnb opposition. NBC DFW 2022, three arrested in a shooting death of former OU player at Dallas Airbnb rental. Northeastern University study finds Airbnb raises violent crime in cities as long-term residents are pushed out. And my question is, how miserable do your constituents need to get before something is done? Thank you. The next speaker is Stephen Kavner, followed by Barbara France. Stephen Kavner, this is where I tell you how long I've been here, but I'm not so good with numbers. And numbers are really a little skewed all, all night. Uh, I've been here since 1997. I've been in Forest Creek Estate since 2001. And uh, we were given a platinum best neighborhood. And you have decided what a best neighborhood is. The best neighborhood designation program recognizes neighborhoods that have gone above and beyond to create a community that's beautiful, engaged, safe, and thriving. But there happens to be a short-term rental in that neighborhood, so not so safe, not so engaging. I came here, I've been here now for six of these meetings, because friends of ours told us of the problem that they were having five miles away in another part of Plano. I thought that was one. But see, I'm not so good with numbers. It wasn't just one. There's also one right in my neighborhood. And then two doors down, they've now renovated a house in three days for 72 hours, is it 70? I think it's 72 hours to renovate it. What is that place gonna be? I don't wanna live near there. I won't be able to sell my house there. That's what all the confusion is. The police numbers I've learned tonight mean that we, should be, we shouldn't be so polite. Every time there's some noise, we better call them. Every time there's garbage in parking, we better call them, because we've been too polite and said, we shouldn't call them, they have more important things to do. Well, this is now important, and we will all start making the calls because we need something done. And the only way we can do it now is to vote for each of you when you're up for re-election, who supports us and who doesn't. Thank you. Hi, my name is Barbara France, and I've lived in Plano for 25 years. My neighborhood does not have a mandatory HOA. Last year, Plano was ranked as the number one safest city in Texas. This is thanks in part to Plano's Crime Prevention Unit. 
They organize and support a neighborhood crime watch program, and they engage with citizens through activities such as National Night Out. There are two basic principles of a neighborhood crime watch. Know your neighbors and report suspicious activity. And this is an effective tool. An analysis by the Department of Justice found that crime watch areas are associated with lower crime. And from our own Plano.gov website, an alert and cooperative neighborhood is the greatest single defense against crime. However, a recent study highlighted a direct link between short-term rentals and an increase in violent crime. This can be attributed to a loss of community cohesion. Fewer residents means fewer engaged citizens and a less effective neighborhood crime watch. We must stop the proliferation of STRs if we want to keep Plano a safe and thriving city. Thank you. The next speaker is Katherine Parker, followed by Benjamin Sow. Mayor Mons, members of the City Council, my name is Arne Parker. My wife and I have lived in Plano for eight years. I've spoken previously about short-term rentals. Tonight, I'm going to talk about bad apples. We have uh, repeatedly heard that there are just a few bad apples. I would like to tell you that every short-term rental is a bad apple. It's just a matter of time. If you live next to one, on every Thursday, you start watching the house and wondering, what will happen this time? Will it be a, a late wild party, drunk people in my front yard fighting? Or will it be a weekend of shooting, drug activity, or something that everybody on this council understands and knows about, prostitution? We shouldn't have to wonder if this weekend that the short-term rental in our neighborhood becomes that bad apple. We live in a single-family resident neighborhood that does not allow commercial lodging Short-term rentals are hotels. These properties need to be in areas that are zoned for hotels, seconds. not in residential neighborhoods like ours. I hope you understand where I'm coming from. We can only take so much till something gives, and we want to like you folks to help us because we need your help. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Long night, so uh, I really don't envy <laughs> your jobs. Um, I did enjoy the little statistics lesson earlier uh, between Mr. Williams and uh, Mr. Richard Deli. I myself enjoy data, so it, it makes me confident and happy to see the diverse background we have on our council here. Um, I know there's business owners. We've got two lawyers. Uh, a man with a very, very long resume. 16-year <laughs> um, veteran of the PISD board, four graduates of PISD as well, um, a five-year veteran of our Parks and Rec Council, and um, three former members of the Plano Zoning Board. So as much as this STR issue impacts all of us out here, um, I know that it deeply impacts each of you and the work you've done for the city as well. Don't let these STRs destroy all the work that each of you have done, all the years you've sacrificed for the city. Our highly rated school district, our amazing parks and recs, all our small businesses, large corporations, they all depend on houses that are filled with citizens and they suffer with the spread of STRs. Now, 20 seconds. before I read your profiles, I had originally thought, you know, city's greatest asset was land, but I was wrong. As Councilwoman Homer says, people, are Plano's greatest asset. I want you to look at everyone on this council, look at everything you've done for this city, and then look out here, this audience, everyone out here, why they're here. This is why the city is great, the people. And this is what happens when homes are filled with citizens. We have people that care and contribute, and people who will continue to build upon what our predecessors have created. Uh, do not let short-term rentals rob our city of its greatest asset. Neighborhoods are for neighbors and Plano and her citizens deserve at least that much. Thank you.
Lynn McQuacker, followed by Glenn Smith. Good evening. My name is Lynn McQuaker. I've lived in Plano for 25 years and raised a family here. And really, everything has been said, and I appreciate all the due diligence you guys are doing and will continue to do. But we are, I'm hoping to retire in the next year and to look for somewhere else to live in Plano. And it came to my attention through all these wonderful people who've kept us informed that it's not what I'll be looking at, whether the roof needs to be fixed or what the comps are. It's going to be, is there an STR close to a home that I might choose to live in? And I hope that with all the due diligence that you'll do and the results that you'll come up with, that somehow at the end there'll be a way to know where these homes are situated so we can choose where we want to live. That the real estate agent I go to can answer the question, is there an SDR on this street that I'm choosing to live in? So I'm hoping that somehow this will be resolved. I'm asking personally because everyone's really said everything that needed to be said. And I hope that you'll come to a resolution that will help all of us. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members, and staff. My name is Glenn Smith. I'm a veteran of the United States Air Force, a Plano resident for 25 years. I moved from Carrollton to Plano in 1997 to raise my children in Plano schools, to live in Plano's neighborhoods, and to build friendships with my neighbors and volunteer and support my community to make a better place to live. Thanks to our citizens and our city leaders, Plano is recognized across the country as a well-run city with excellent neighborhood communities and a very attractive location for large and small businesses. However, in recent years, the advent of a new type of uncontrolled, unregulated lodging business has been created, which rents houses for the use of vacationing, weekend getaways, and unrespectable activities which are beginning to erode the very nature of what has made Plano the community that has attracted both families and businesses to our city. The creation of uncontrolled transformation of outwardly beautiful residential homes into inwardly ugly boarding houses, crime bases, and party houses is beginning to turn the pride and joy of Plano 20 seconds. into a growing non-neighborly act of nuisance, crime, and disruption. Unless we make hard and fast changes that are for our residents, now over 700 known STR properties will increase exponentially and without it, a continuation and dramatic increase in the crime numbers we all hate to hear about in our city of Plano. And don't think this is just about us, our neighbors, who have come here tonight to ask for your help. With the exception of one of two of you, everyone on the city council has these in your neighborhoods. And in some cases, up to 18 people can come into that house just think about what can happen to your weekend and your children if they're young enough. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. The next speaker is Stephen Kiriakos, and followed by Dana Fox. Good evening. My name is Stephen Kiriakos. I'm an 18-year resident of Plano. First, thank you for putting this on your agenda, and thank you, gentlemen, for the very good presentation. It was very interesting. Um, second, we need a plan. <clears throat> we're good at planning. In fact, some would, say, some would say we're excellent at planning. Just read the sign there. Premier parks, recreation centers, arts, outstanding police, excellent schools. We need a plan for STRs. To be clear, we're not against STRs as an industry. We're against having them in our neighborhoods. You and me and all the citizens of Plano need to make a plan for the next 150 years. I would suggest we start now. My notes from this evening. One, invest in accurate data collection. I've heard all kinds of numbers from AirDNA. Subscribe to AirDNA and get the right numbers. I, I have, we can, and we can do that together. You can't make good decisions without good data. Uh, STRs, this is mentioned before, not commercial. We collect hotel tax, but they're not hotels for PNZ. We need to sort that out. 
I can't really focus on a target if it has all these different personalities and names. So we need to get that straightened out. 20 uh, seconds. HOAs, uh, y'all have mentioned some success in the courts with HOAs. Let's not leave this up to the HOAs because some folks don't have very strong or required HOAs. Let's make it a city issue and a city solution, please. Um, and the solution is gonna be complicated. It's not gonna be a one size fits all. Let's learn from other cities and their failures. Don't follow the failures, but follow the advice of proactive prohibition. Really like that idea. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council for letting me speak tonight. My name, my, my name is Dana Fox, and I've been, a, uh, I've been a citizen of Plano for two years. My husband's been a citizen for 10 years. We're newlyweds. The short-term rental next door to me is rented by the room, five bedrooms, and it is not listed on either Airbnb or VBRO. I have called about this property on several property violations. However, very recently, this nuisance took on a whole new level. On this night, my 16-year-old stepdaughter was, par was parking her car outside of our home. She was coming home late from work. A van, with its lights off, followed her in and parked behind her very close. This maneuver was on purpose. For a few minutes, the van parked, the van, after a few minutes, the van backed away and moved into the middle of the street and laid idle, still with its lights off. At this point, my stepdaughter was so afraid, she had tried to text us, she couldn't reach us because we were in the house. When she saw that the ha when this car had just moved over to the middle of the street and laid idle in the middle of the street, she bolted for the, from her car and ran inside the house and had a look of terror on her face. The behavior of this van didn't go seconds. unnoticed because another, another resident called the police. It turns out that this visitor was someone as, was, a, was part of one of the renters next door. He didn't like all of the parking that was happening on the street. So he was taking it upon himself to enforce and have her not be there. He was trying to frighten her, and it worked. The churn at this residential of this house is not residential, and it should not be permitted. We don't know who lives next door to us. Please uphold our current zoning laws and not allow these types of businesses in our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Marla Kiriakos, followed by Joni Reed. Good evening, Mayor Munns and uh, Plano City Council members. I'm Marla Kiriakos, a 40-year resident of Plano. I invested in my neighborhood, assured that I would have a protected residential lifestyle where I could raise a family. But that assurance vanished with the appearance of short-term rentals in Plano. The trash, parking, and noise issues accompanying the threat of illegal activities that may occur, as we all saw in the sex ring being run out of a Plano STR. We found ourselves having to create this grassroots movement to convince you that it's time to act on behalf of your constituents. We face opposition from deep pocket business groups that can bully their way past the city council and into our backyards. Registration only does not solve the problems that your citizens are now facing. We as individual Plano residents cannot defend ourselves against this proliferation. We are begging you as our elected representatives to stand up to this issue that threatens our daily lives as residents of Plano. So I ask you, what is your obligation and responsibility to the citizens of Plano? This is the turning point. We need your help, and we need it now. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joni Reed, and I live in Pittman Creek Estates. I have heard a lot tonight about STR's rights, but where are my five-year-old daughter's rights to play in her front yard and not be scared of the people coming in and out who we have no idea who they are? We live directly across the street from a park. I can throw a stone and hit the park. Your city, our city, says that a pedophile, a sex offender, cannot live within 1,000 feet of a park. But how would you know who's renting the Airbnb for 21 days? 
The city says that anybody living somewhere more than seven days must be registered as a sex offender. Well, the Airbnb in my neighborhood gets rented 21 days at a time, and none of you would know if a pedophile is living there. And my daughter's at the park, and they have access to her. So where are her rights? I am a constitutionalist through and through. I do not want you to take away people's property rights. Trust me when I say that. But no one does background checks on these people, not Airbnb, not VRBO, not you. We didn't even know a sex trafficking ring was in our neighborhoods. So when you have children involved, nobody can guarantee me that a pedophile, a sex offender, is not walking in and out of my park with access to my child. It's seconds. not a matter of if something bad happens, it's a matter of when. And so we're begging you tonight to take action and do something real, not a registration, sure. It's a little bit of a Band-Aid, but we need more help than that. And what makes me the most angry tonight is that if any of these STRs lived directly next to you, you would be working behind the scenes of this city. You would be using your connections and pulling strings to make sure it didn't happen. We are not your enemies. This room is not your enemies. We need your help. We are on the same team, and it is time to start acting like it tonight. Thank you. The next speaker is Teresa Garner, followed by Mark Clapper. Teresa had to leave. Okay. Then Mark Clapper, followed by John Arbuckle. So do I get three minutes? I'm sorry. <laughs> Good evening. I'm a Plano resident for over 34 years, and like many of these people here, we moved here because of what the city of Plano stood for. It was a suburb, quiet community, city of excellence, great schools, all these wonderful things that you pick a city for. The city of Plano has been infected by two STDs. HDAs, which are high-density apartments, and short-term rentals. Now, for the most part, like I said, there's that bad apple. Many of them operate quietly for a few of these, but in some cases, like the one we had a while back, we could not find a place to go up and down our street. Literally, back-to-back -back cars of both sides down the cul-de-sac, down the next cul-de-sac, down the side street. We counted over 50 cars and quit counting. I'm sure that occupancy there, and none of them were our residents because we were all complaining we couldn't get down the street. This is just one example. The parties sometimes do spill out in the streets. You have a serious problem here, and I know it's not an easy problem because of the legal issues that are being preset by the courts. So I'd like to propose something that was done back in the overpass days, is that along with the HOAs and the Texas Network Coalition, that we, a neighborhood coalition, that we form a citizens task force, that we work together with the city, 20 and seconds. look at working with the city on using what we can apply into our HOA uh, guidances, our laws, uh, along with giving you the input that we can provide to give you the needs on the ordinances things and give you the support that you need. I think we have to work together on this issue. This is not something that we can see the city taking on by itself. Good evening, everyone. I had a speech prepared. I think I'm gonna um, go rogue on that and just give you my opinion. I moved here about six months ago, um, primarily from California. And most, most cities in California aren't that well run. So I've, since I've been here, I pay a lot of attention to how you operate as a city, and you guys do great work. Um, in your city run, the way you run it, you keep the forest fires down. You guys run things well, so you don't have a bunch of emergency situations that you're dealing with. That's just good planning. Uh, listening to all the people out here in the audience and just neighbors that I, that I associate with, this is a raging inferno that you guys need to deal with immediately because the longer you sit on it, the bigger it gets and the more damage it does forever. It's not gonna go away, it's not gonna recede. So you need to get it, knock it down now as quickly as you possibly can because I doubt any of you support short-term rentals yourselves. So that's all I got to say, thank you for the time. The next speaker is Richard Brigham, followed by Irene Ye. Mayor, City Council, I know this has been a long night for you as well as for all of us who have been awaiting our turn to address you on this issue. 
my name is Richard Brigham. I'm a retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel. And during my life, I've had the opportunity to live in a lot of different places, uh, both in my military service and out. Forest Creek Estates in Plano is by far the nicest place I have ever lived. Our neighborhood, as you've heard before, has been recognized as Platinum Level and Best in Plano Award winner. Uh, I've lived there now for over 20 years. The short-term rental I'm about to discuss is directly across the street from my house. Uh, thank goodness it's across the street and not next door. I don't get nearly the noise that Jack has to contend with and his son. Uh, lots of renters have been quiet and blended into the neighborhood for a few days, and we barely knew they were there. Others have not been so respectful. Weekend gatherings, birthday parties have brought large numbers of people, sometimes in excess of 25 to 40 individuals in the party house for the day. It says on Airbnb, sleeps nine, has a pool. By my definition, that's a party looking for a place to happen. Okay. Uh, cars are parked on cul-de-sac. There is not sufficient room for a fire truck to get to a house at the end of the cul-de-sac to fight a fire because there are too many cars parked on both sides of the street. Um, right now, I'm talking about one home. What happens when that becomes six or 10? The rental properties don't pay HOA dues. They don't take care of the property as well. It will become known that there are short-term rentals in the area and the value of my house will diminish and so will that of my neighborhood. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's been really late and long for all of you. My name is Irene Ye. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, uh, Council members. This is my third time here. My first time was back in 2020. I spoke and no one listened. If someone would have taken action, then no, these guys would probably be here. Because nothing was done at that time. Nobody was listening to me. This guy in the back of my alley, back of my house, separated by the alley, was the owner who turned this house into a Airbnb. Then he formed an LLC, so he doesn't even own it anymore. It's a company, even reduced liability. And let me tell you what happened Friday afternoon. I was freaking out because a car was driving into my driveway. I was working, looking down my backyard. This car comes in. I was like freaking out. If you were me, how do you feel at that time? Scared, shocked, seconds. mad? That's how I feel. Well, guess what? It's one of the guests doesn't know how to drive into that alleyway to the parking. He decided to come to my side and do a backup into their driveway. All right. Not only this is a new one for you to add to it, property trespassing, because they did that to me more than once. Also, damaged my fence on some stupid idiot who couldn't drive onto that driveway, damaged my fence, broke a bin. I have to spend money to fix. I don't have camera to prove that they had damaged it, but I know they did. So you guys got to do something. I complained two plus years ago. Nobody listened. And it's time to take action, please. And don't believe that you cannot grandfather. I've suffered enough over three years. Enough is enough. Thank you. All right? Thank you. The next speaker is Karina Kingman, followed by Lydia Ortega. Good evening, <clears throat> Mayor Munns, Council, and fellow citizens of Plano and my amazing neighbors. <sighs> we are the newbies here. Um, everybody else has been here forever, and um, we've been here about six months. Um, when we drove into the neighborhood of Forest Creek Estates, I cannot even tell you 
it was just instant love. Um, people were going down the path. They were jogging. They were waving. There were kids in strollers. There were kids playing outside. And we drove further into the neighborhood. Um, people were waving and saying, hello. They don't even know us. And we see Adirondack chairs out in front of the houses. And I keep telling everybody, you guys, this is amazing. Because it showed me that this is a community who really socializes with each other. They don't just go in, shut their doors and their garages, and you never see them. And I have, we have come in the last six months, even less than that, to feel like this is our family already. Um, these are people who care about each other. They're passionate, as you can see. They, want, they love this neighborhood. We love seconds. this neighborhood, and we want it to stay this way. And I'm going to go a little bit rogue off my speech. First of all, when I heard about this um, sex trafficking, I mean, we have five daughters. And you want to talk about that? I can't even imagine. I'm sure you can't either having that right next door to you. That, what do you do? My neighbor is here. His name is Jack. He told me uh, this Thursday there were 40 people in the, Airbnb, the our STR right next to his house. He's, he and his son are afraid to go outside. They've built a fence on their own dime. That doesn't stop hearing the profanity over the fence. That doesn't stop. That doesn't create a safe place. Um, he said kids, kids were pouring out of the back of the trunk of cars. There were 40 people there. I mean, this is crazy. So please, as you've heard from all of us today, please help us. Please take a stand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Am I the finale? This is it. Uh, I'm at a loss for words. I didn't even bring down my speech because I thought I knew what property rights were. And when I signed on on that contract that said single family residential neighborhood, I thought, well, there's limits there, okay? I can't open up a store. There's a lot of things here. Single family residential property. Everybody that is bought a house in that area knew the terms of the property rights that they were getting single family residential neighborhood property rights. But somebody said, you know what? They're very clever. It doesn't exclude short-term rentals. It says nothing about short-term rentals. You can't play that game legally because I have to tell you, there's no way you can define the word residential, you can define the word single family, uh, enough to get around what somebody will come up with. So I believe that all the people that are doing the STRs they have the same property rights that I have. What I want to know is, why aren't you fighting for my property rights? Because they are taken away through these negative externalities that you've heard everybody describe here. They're taking away the quality of life. They're imposing negative seconds. externalities on everybody. And the lawsuit should be from the people to the courts to say that we have standing from injury. You know what, STRs, these, these short-term rentals, are character characteristically, by their nature, incompatible with a uh, single-family residential area. So fight for us. There have been so many lawsuits back and forth between citizens and the council. Fight for us on the law with this one, and we'll fight with you. Thank you. The next speaker is Jenna Hansen, who will be followed by Dave Schwarte. Good evening. My husband and I have lived in this city for a really long time. Anthony can tell you we went to kindergarten together. Okay? So, honestly, to come here and talk to you tonight, it's not what I want to do. It's not. Um, but I'm going to tell you with some time constraints about one specific thing. And if I have to keep coming back and telling you each individual story, I will. Um, I have three main problems that I want to talk about, and they all have to do with safety. It's drug use, it's public arrests, and it's confrontation of a minor. Um, just the other day, my son was on his way home, and he was confronted in front of our home. Keep in mind that this neighbor has rented this property at $42 a night per room. 
confrontation of a minor. Just last week when he was coming home, he was approached by a grown man on our dark neighborhood street. It caught him by surprise. The man told him he didn't belong on the street and needed to leave. Does that sound familiar? Now, this might seem like no big deal that a grown man is approaching minors at night on a public street until you find out he doesn't live on that street. My son came directly inside. He told me how uncomfortable seconds. he was. He told me that the man came from the rent house, and he told me that the guy was waiting for him in a big brown van. Do you want a creepy van that doesn't belong with an unknown adult approaching your child? How about at night? How about knocking on his door? I attempted to contact the owner of the rental, explain the situation, and I asked him for the short-term renters to not talk to my children. He says that he didn't have any renters that looked like that. It turns out it wasn't even the renter. It was a guest of the renter who had been staying there. So not only if you track them, does that not mean that it's actually who's staying there? You don't know. And like it was mentioned earlier, what if it's just predators who are going from one house to the next house looking for someone? If that was my daughter, we'd be having a different conversation right now. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Suarte, go ahead. Be sure to turn on your camera. Yes, hi, Jay Shorty here. Uh, I am uh, representing the Texas Neighborhood Coalition. I live in Arlington, and I was heavily involved in the development of the ordinance uh, that bans short-term rentals in most, short in most uh, residential neighborhoods. Uh, that ordinance has been referred to on several occasions by your outside counsel. Uh, I am an attorney with over 40 years of experience. I'm here to urge you to take prompt action to get short-term rentals out of residential neighborhoods in Plano. You've heard the misery that they create. And in fact, we work with cities across the state and the misery they create is universal. I've got a few points to make regarding the Arlington ordinance. First, uh, while we uh, have not yet gotten to trial on the merits, we are completely unafraid of trial. Uh, as has been noted, we won a fight against uh, the short-term rental people in the Court of Appeals. And since then, several of the plaintiffs who were short-term rental renters have in fact dropped out of the lawsuit. And I want to caution you, if you want to wait for absolute legal certainty before you take action to protect neighborhoods, the price will seconds. be that of neighborhoods across the, the city. I also want to stress that we did not grandfather any short-term rentals. We did not. Uh, and uh, also note for you that we have a total ban on short-term rentals. So does Grapevine, and that was upheld going forward. I've heard some questions about why you shouldn't follow Arlington's example. Time. I think you should. If we can help you, let me know. Thank you. Thank you. So go ahead. The next speaker is Jessica Black, who's also joining us from Zoom. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Jessica Black from Arlington, Texas, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Texas Neighborhood Coalition. Plano zoning code is a code of enumerated allowed uses. If a use is not expressly allowed, it's disallowed. Undefined and contemplated land uses are to be matched to the defined uses, which they are most similar, which in the case of STRs is clearly other forms of transient commercial lodging. Other forms of transient commercial lodging, such as bed and breakfast and hotels are not permitted in Plano's single family residential zones. 
Even if the city attorneys are unwilling to concede this point, the case law from Austin, Grapevine, and Arlington makes it clear that Texas cities have the authority to prohibit new STRs going forward. Austin and Grapevine were only required to grandfather STRs that were already in operation. Mr. Pittman said Arlington's regulations were subject to grandfathering. However, that's incorrect. The courts did not require Arlington to grandfather existing STRs. The collective takeaway from these three cases is that this council has the power to stop the continued proliferation of STRs in Plano. It simply needs to muster the political courage to use it to protect the residents you were elected to serve. 20 seconds. Thank you. The next speaker is Cindy Patillo, followed by Greg Patillo. years, and I'm here to talk tonight about this meeting, which has been all over local media all day. The common theme seems to be that this council is addressing the topic of short-term rentals in direct response to the sex trafficking bust that the Dallas Police Department executed at an STR in Plano on September 23rd. I just want to make clear to anyone new to the issue of STRs in Plano residential neighborhoods that a group of concerned citizens has been coming to these meetings consistently since at least April of this year, asking for your help. This meeting about this topic has been scheduled on this date for weeks. So what happens now? As the attorneys here have stated, case law is evolving and there's a lot still to be settled. We are asking you, for, we are asking you to take bold action, to stand up for your resident homeowners and to lead the charge to protect our rights. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Greg Patillo. I've lived in Plano with Cindy for 29 years. Um, I'm so appreciative of my neighbors for coming here and talking about some of the issues that short-term rentals has, and this is not gonna come off very well, but I apologize. Um, so I can talk about the thing that registration doesn't solve, the thing that nuisance ordinances doesn't solve, and that's the economic impact of short-term rentals. If you just look at the school system, uh, we've eliminated 237 students thus far, 1.5 million in annual funding, and 17 lost teacher jobs. And that's just today. Uh, moving forward, looking at local businesses, um, we have eliminated almost 1,400 residential consumers. Fewer customers, fewer sales, fewer jobs, lower sales tax. And these are just a huge list or a small list of the businesses that are there. It's time that Texans need to figure out where we stand. We either are pro-property rights or we are pro-property rights, pro-education, pro-small business, and pro-family values. Okay, so the property rights, there's up to eight property uh, owners next to these STRs. Pro-education, defunding uh, through dropped-in enrollment. Pro-small business, displacing residential consumers with transients. And pro-family values and forcing families out of neighborhoods. The last speaker is Corey Reinecker. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, my name is Corey Reinecker. I've lived in the Old Town neighborhood for uh, since 2011. I've been a homeowner there since then. Uh, I'm the founding member and the treasurer of the Old Town Neighborhood Association, which was born out of Love Where You Live. Uh, and I'm a graduate of the Neighborhood Leadership, Leadership Association. Since 2017, I've also hosted a short-term rental at my primary residence in the neighborhood. Um, over that 
over those past five years, I've welcomed travelers from around the world. Um, I've met great people and we've made lifelong friends. The extra income that we've earned uh, by hosting a, a short-term rental has allowed us to reinvest in our property and has also provided a semi-passive cushion of income that has helped as a buffer uh, during uncertain economic times. The advantage that we've seen uh, with short-term rental is the flexibility. We're able to, we, we have originally considered having uh, a rental maybe to a college student or somebody with a spare bedroom. Uh, but the advantage of short-term rental is, hey, if family comes into town, we can block the room and they can stay there. Um, I'm a super sympathetic to the issues of everyone who's spoken here tonight. Uh, I wouldn't want any of that going on next to me either. The house next door to me also happens to be a short-term rental as my neighbors moved out in 2020. <laughs> Over the two years that that's been a, a rental, the majority of the people who have stayed there have been families moving to, moving to Plano and other Plano residents who are stay there while their homes are being renovated. Um, if the city, what I heard from the legal review is that the city has tools that can address a lot of these problems already. One thing that I didn't hear is maybe a zoning solution that might involve a citizen initi initiated overlay district to perhaps go neighborhood by neighborhood and address short term rentals. Thank you. Thank you. We, um, is that all the speakers? So we, uh, this item was for discussion and direction, and we can't thank you all enough for, for your comments and your feedback. And it means a lot to us, and it'll help us make uh, decisions on guidance and going forward. What we'd like to do right now is take a recess uh, into executive session briefly, and we'll come back out uh, as soon as we can. the whole thing and so we'll recess into executive session training room a to hold an executive meeting pursuant to the provisions of vernon's texas codes government code 551 section 551.071 to consult with the attorney to receive legal advice and discuss litigation thank you
I now declare the Plano City Council is convened in open session that all council members are present. We're going back to item number five that we've been on for a little while. And um, so what I'm going to do is we're, we're going to ask for direction from uh, the council. We'll just kind of, I'll start over with you, uh, Council Member Smith, and uh, give your thoughts and directions to staff and, and then... Uh, Councilmember Homer and on on around, and I hopefully uh, it's consensus enough that that uh, staff understands what we're trying to do. Thank so, you, thank, thank you, Mayor. Uh, free to go. Well, first of all, especially those who are still here, we really appreciate you coming out and sharing, sharing your concerns with us. Um, we heard a lot of interesting things tonight. We heard legal opinions, we heard personal stories, and, and I think uh, it's pretty clear to me anyway that that uh, the, the really. At this point, the only successful venture or foray in, into this challenge has been the, the Arlington case. So I would suggest that uh, we look at that and see the things that they had done that we could follow that are applicable to, to our city, uh, including registration so we can get data, uh, look at zoning, uh, let's look at uses, how is what is the true definition of a short-term rental? I, I mean, I think there's some varying opinions on that. So until we have the facts, I don't, I don't think it'd be prudent of us to just make something, make some ordinance without uh, the, the ability to back it up with facts because it, because it would be overturned. So, so that's, that's where I'd like to go is to kind of look at the Arlington model, uh, consider the registration and also consider looking at, uh, at the zoning aspects of it. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's important that we get good data so that we can kind of follow that, that same model. Um, I understand that we are going to be paying to get the actual data rather than the free, so that's already in the works, is my understanding from staff. I do think we need to look at zoning and, and maybe send this to zoning to um, make some, some recommendations. Um, I mean, it's very clear, you know, I think we had one person that was in favor of short-term rentals that spoke tonight and everybody else um, had issues with it. So, I mean, clearly it's it's something that's really important to a lot of people here in Plano and it is something we need to address and um, we're trying to really thoughtfully do that um, in the best way possible <clears throat> and limit, um, you know, litigation and, and un unnecessary waste of taxpayer dollars um, if we can find another way around it. So I think that's really important. I do think in the meantime, while we're trying to investigate how we can move forward with, with some of these ideas, we do need to beef up um, enforcing our um, um, ordinances. It was a little troublesome to hear some of the things that were expressed tonight. Some, I mean, they're horror stories. They're very disturbing to hear some of the things that you've all experienced. Um, and one example was given with a, a child um, that then was texting to try to get in touch with the parents. And I just want to make sure we're teaching our children and our everyone, call 911. Don't hesitate to call 911. If you ever feel in danger, teach your children that. Teach, I mean, that's, we have a wonderful police force. Um, you know, they're, they, we were raised to, you know, only call 911 if it's an emergency. No, if there's anything that makes you uncomfortable that you, you know, are questioning if you're safe, please, your safety is first and foremost. So please, I, I feel like that was something that troubled me a little bit hearing that tonight. So um, anyway, um, yeah, I definitely see that there's a need for us to, to do something and, and move forward with um, investigating how we can implement some things moving forward. Uh, I spent several years as the Crime Watch Area Coordinator for Timberbrook Estates. And um, as one of the speakers mentioned tonight, one of the very staples of Crime Watch is know your neighbors. Um, that's really important. And I don't live next to a short-term rental. To my knowledge, there are none in my neighborhood. Um, and I value knowing my neighbors. I value the fabric of community that I have in my neighborhood. I sought it out um, in my current neighborhood and the first neighborhood that I lived in Plano, which is Timberbrook Estates. Um, the value of that cannot be overstated. We all seek that community in Plano. 
So I would like to pursue uh, a process of zoning which recognizes that short-term rentals um, for that duration aren't a, they don't constitute what we can, would consider a residential use because they're not residents. Nobody lives there. Um, a good friend of mine lives several doors down. He, is, he leases his home. I've known him for years. He still leases. That's not, there's nothing short-term about it. I know it, I know him, we have a relationship. He's part of our community. So I would like to go through the zoning process, um, the Plano version of what Arlington did to look at our city and craft something that recognizes that residential areas are for residential purposes. So I, I think I, I concur with everything that's been said. I, I believe that um, you know, obviously, we're all Plano residents. We all live inside Plano neighborhood. So, uh, you know, I I, I don't want to be I, I don't want to be taught talked to like uh, I'm an outsider. No, I, I've lived in Plano for 28 years, and I understand the importance of having a neighborhood. Um, however, I also don't believe in spending money when it's a, it's a waste. I want our money to be spent on things that could really make a difference. And I'm not afraid of confrontation. I've been a, little, I've been a litigator almost 20 years, so I'm not afraid of going against in the battle of defending what we believe to be right. But I want our money to be spent on things that's going to make a difference. So, for example, once we have something that we could um, be determined to be our own, for example, um, making some type of um, ordinance that could be uh, through the zoning process that we could use um, to protect and to defend our decision. Then, you know, whatever happens, happens. We'll just go forward and, and face that. So I, I, I agree with, you know, with everybody who's already spoken. Um, I, I think that starting with um, the definition of, um, of, of STR, we need to figure it out where it belongs. We need to figure out how to, to uh, in, uh, issue uh, or determine or modify our zoning to make sure that STR is specifically dealt with. And then, um, I also believe that registration needs to continue because we really need the data. Um, we need something to, 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 you know, to shield us and protect us once we are facing whatever it is that, that's gonna come our way. Um, so with that, that's it. Um, I would like for us to, as was uh, mentioned uh, by uh, the chief, work uh, more closely with the platforms. I think that um, some of the platforms um, have an interest in wanting us to um, have a safe city, and so I think we need to work more closely with them. I think we need to work on our enforcement. I also agree with my colleagues that registration is important, and we've got to have the data to make sure that we're making um, good decisions. But on the registration, I want us to make sure that we have permitting that can be revoked. I think that's important, so it's not just registration, but that it's also um, a permit that can be revoked. And on um, the zoning that others have mentioned, I'm open to looking at the Arlington case, and um, for sure we need to divine our zoning law like all of you have mentioned, um, but I really want to know the reasons why people are getting a short-term rental in Plano when we look at this data versus Arlington. We're not Arlington, we're not the same type of city. They are a large entertainment district, Plano is not, and so I think um, developing an entertainment district may not work here, so um, I think we might have to be creative in how we develop um, a district for short-term rentals. Um, that may not work the same way it works in Arlington, so, um, but I'm open to um, seeing what the data comes back with and what we could come up with. Okay, well, it's been a long night, and I don't want to bore everybody with everything that has already been said. 
Um, but I will. Uh, <laughs> they said a lot of same things to us. I'm going to say a lot of same thing back. But I, all I really want to do is, um, first, I really want to say that um, there's, there's a time and place, I think, for everything. Um, and uh, I will be uh, very truthful and honest to say that there are times that I have vacationed in places where I have used a rental, and it's a, it's a vacation place. It's a, it's a waterfront, it's a seafront, uh, it's a mountain lodge, um, whatever it might be. It, but it's not in the middle of my neighborhood. Um, and having something in the middle of my neighborhood count as a a vacation spot um, just doesn't seem to ring with, to me to be really true. And so, you know, I really look at them as a different model. And and, and some of you know, um, I'm not real thrilled with, with the model that short-term rentals are using today to just kind of proliferate a business model where individuals are actually becoming um, fairly wealthy and usually their corporations or or individuals that have bought many of these and then have rented them out on a short-term basis because you can obviously get more money off of a, a house if you rent it on a short-term basis than over a 60-day or a 90-day or a one-year or six-month period of time. So I'm, I won't go into the financial modeling of it. Other than that, that is an attack place at some time in the future. So I think we have to look at this as what can we do in the short-term, what can we do in the mid-term, what can we do in the long-term? My friends around the, the circle here have already talked about um, looking at the platforms and working with the platforms, working with data and getting more data, um, and I think we need to do that. Um, I think we also need to take a look at licensing and registration, so at least we have some data coming in from there, and we know where some of them are. Will we know where they all are? We probably won't because it is correct that individuals will probably try to skip that step, and they'll also say, oh, there's only going to be two people there when really it's going to be 200. Um, and we need to figure out what we're going to do in response to if you really say you're going to have two there and you, only, and you have 200, what's the response going to be? Um, I, I think we need to ha truly have a better definition of what a short-term rental means to us. Um, and, and if that means that it goes into it is a commercial property of some sort, then that's what it is. But we really need to take a look at that, that definition. The other thing that I think we need to do in the short term is strengthen some of our ordinances that deal with noise and trash and other things that cause significant nuisances um, because then we have some leverage on the short term. So uh, I'm, I think from a staffing standpoint, we need to take a look at what do we strengthen so that we can go in and, and do some necessary things, some policing that we need to do. And that leads to what um, Councilwoman uh, Homer talked about. If you see something, say something. I understand it is that my first reaction is going to be that I will protect my daughter with my life. But the same thing is, is that if I see something that's really bad, I will protect her and I will also call 911 because I want that jerk off the, off the street, period. So uh, you've, you've got to be able to do that. You've got to be able to fear feel that you've got to be able to report those types of things and, and report them so that we have. It's even extra data for us. So anyway, I've, I've said enough uh, on this evening, and I'll pass it off. Okay. Well, I guess uh, other than the mayor, I'll bring up the rear on this issue. But obviously, we've heard a plethora of testimony from Plano residents who have been adversely impacted by short-term rentals in their neighborhoods. And while we don't have perfect data yet, as we discussed earlier, the preliminary data that we do have suggests that the incidence of noise complaints in 2022 has been significantly higher, perhaps two times or three times higher at short-term rentals in Plano than at other types of housing. Uh, obviously, it's important to get as close to the exact number of short-term rentals as we can uh, so that we can do exact calculations and, and know what's going on in the city. So I'm glad to hear that the purchase of that data is underway and anything we can do to get our hands on the most accurate data possible to make good decisions, I think, is important. Uh, I will say that, that uh, I think we've been studying this issue for two or three years already. Uh, I know we've received reports. Uh, certainly, I remember, uh, you know, at least one meeting that was on Zoom, you know, during the early pandemic days of 2020, and, and it may go back to 2019. So 
I think we're, you know, we're, we're in the red zone on this, to use a football analogy. And so I hope that, the, that, that this last step of information gathering can be expedited. Um, uh, more important than the, than the noise is the safety issues that have been discussed, both, uh, both feeling unsafe and being unsafe. And like I think everyone on the council has articulated, we need to protect our residents. So, you know, the main argument I've heard against enacting zoning regulations with respect to short-term rentals is property rights, which is a serious argument because property rights is, are important and I'm an advocate for robust property rights, but the property rights of short-term rental operators are not the only property rights that are at stake here. Mm -hmm. The property rights of homeowners and long-term renters who live near short-term rentals to continue to be able to use and enjoy their property is also at stake. So I think uh, zoning uh, always involves balancing competing property rights you know, if I say that my next door neighbor, as, as we do through our zoning ordinance, can't operate a drive through or an all night diner, that takes away one possible use of, of their property. But if we didn't do that, it would impair my use of my property. So I absolutely think that to get this balancing act right, we have to move forward with, uh, with zoning. And uh, I think we should follow the general path that Arlington is on and uh, move forward with Arlington's two pronged approach of enacting zoning regulations and a registration program that requires licenses and that revokes those licenses for problem properties that have proven to be a nuisance due to multiple violations of law. Uh, obviously, uh, as Mayor Pro Tem Prince indicated, we're not Arlington. I don't think an entertainment district makes sense in Plano because you know, we don't have Cowboy Stadium or the ballpark at Arlington or Six Flags or Hurricane Harbor. So I don't know that we have an entertainment district in Plano. So I think that's an excellent point. So that's not to say everything is going to be exactly like Arlington, but the general path that they're on, I think, is the blueprint that we should follow for, you know, uh, successful regulation. And I also agree with strengthening our general nuisance ordinances and I want to underscore the point that Councilmember Holmer and Councilmember Grady made. If you see something, say something, because, you know, uh, uh, it, it helps to have those data points. You know, I think we found out tonight that there's, you know, some criminal in a van going around and, and, and going to short-term rentals. And, you know, who, who knows what could happen with that situation. And I'm glad we connected two data points. The more data we have, the better we can do. So even if a situation resolves, report it. Make sure that the city's aware of it, and that's going to help us to protect you. So, uh, so I think we, you know, we move forward on the general path Arlington's on, and 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 I think we'll be on a good path. So, thank you. Good. Well, I I want to thank all of you for for your patience. Uh, you've come when it was not on the agenda many times, and we appreciate that. It's believe me, we have we have been constantly working on uh, what what we can legally do, and those things have been on our mind as many of you said, way back in the spring when, when you started coming and telling us about it, and we've known about it. We just are, are trying to make sure, A, we, we protect the taxpayer and, and not put them into a, you know, a problem where we're, we're costing money to the taxpayer. But at the same time, it's important that we have safe neighborhoods, good neighborhoods, as you all have described, and what, what you're wanting. And I agree with the, the council here that these are the things that we need to do initially to move forward as quickly as we can. But at the same time, the registration, the permitting is going to help us enforce some of these things so much more uh, properly. And, and we're going to have, you know, ch noise ordinances and parking ordinances, areas that I heard tonight that those were really issues of, you know, Above and beyond that is the safety issue, and I think that's really important for all of us here in Plano because we do live in a city of excellence that is safe, and that's why so many of us live here. I've lived here for 53 years. I love this city, and I want it to remain the city that you all describe as a great city, and we got to maintain that. And so it's really important to us that we come up with solutions very quickly, and part of that is through zoning. And, and permitting and making sure that we know uh, who's, who's doing a short-term rental and who's not. And so it's gonna be really important for us to, to move along and we've already been assured that that process has already started in, in registration and permitting. So with that being said, uh, thank you so much for your patience. We're gonna move forward. Staff knows where we wanna go. And so uh, over the next few months, we'll continue to communicate 
how we want to move forward and things that have changed throughout the zoning process and, and permitting process. So thank you very much. Item number one, <laughs> public hearing and consideration of an ordinance to amend the comprehensive plan for actions outside the focus of the 2020-2021 comprehensive plan review process for minor updates to maps and, <coughs> excuse me, and providing a severability clause and effective date. Want some water? <laughs> Did you finish? Okay, all right. <laughs> I wasn't sure. Okay. Right. Item number one is a public hearing and consideration of an ordinance to amend the comprehensive plan. So this is um, actions that have been outside the focus of the 2020 through 2021 comprehensive plan review process and minor updates to the maps. So quickly, considering the hour of the evening, you may recollect that the comprehensive plan review process focused on four key topics, so not all of the comprehensive plan was reviewed through that process. So we have a number of policies that really have been sitting around for quite some time. So when we did our normal plan review, um, we had a lot of policies that have been around since about 2015. So the comprehensive plan is in an online format. We provide feedback to the public. Is it recurring? Is it pending? Is it complete? the status update on actions. So we found a number of actions that are complete. So we have an example up here of the library's policy where they're creating a marketing program. Well, it turns out they've already done this. So we needed to update that to say that they'll evaluate their marketing plan rather than create the marketing plan. So that's an example of one of the changes we've made. So these recommendations are generally like this. We provided, got feedback from lead departments on the status of updates of these obsolete or outdated actions, and it'll help us be more efficient. Also, there's a few minor map updates that I'll talk through, some on the future land use map and dashboards, and then some on the thoroughfare plan map. So moving forward, we'll continue this annual review cycle and in 2023 begin a regular cycle of review. So this is a summary table that shows you the majority are either in social environment or natural environment, uh, few in economic environment and regionalism. And then I've got these in case anyone has questions. I've got these in a table format. Um, there are, I believe, 10 in ongoing implementation uh, two in updated direction, three in new actions that are being proposed, and then two that are being removed due to completion or just no longer being viable. So the maps are being changed because there was a uh, just some change in terminology that needed to be consistent that we found on the future land use map in the neighborhoods category. So that's just an alignment of terminology that we're proposing there. Um, also, you'll see some uh, proposed changes with regard to updating transit facilities. We find that it was going to be less confusing for people if we designated whether a transit facility was existing or a future transit facility, since those locations are not uh, firm at this point in time. So you'll see that updated as well on the dashboard as two different symbols that we're using. And then thoroughfare plan amendments, there's four different amendments there. Um, either for planned improvements, such as the Oak Point area, or existing improvements. 
such as in Legacy West, just noting those changes that have occurred. So the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval six to zero. Um, we don't have any public feedback on these changes. Um, and the just a side note that the first full annual report on this comprehensive plan will be forthcoming in the first quarter of the next uh, calendar year. So that's my report on this item, and I'd be glad to answer questions you might have. Thank you. Any questions for Christina? All right. Thank you. I'll open the public hearing. There are no speakers on this item. I'll close the public hearing and confine the comments of the council. Motion to approve. Second motion. A motion and a second to approve agenda item number one. Please vote. Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Next. Item. item number two, public hearing consideration of a resolution to approve the terms and conditions of an interlocal agreement and memorandum of understanding by and between the City of Plano, the City of McKinney, the City of Frisco, and the Collin County Sheriff's Office for the disbursement of the 2022 Edward Byrne Justice Assistant Grant funds, authorizing its execution by the City Manager and providing an effective date. Mayor and Council, this is a, an annual grant program that the police department participates in with shared funds uh, that spread throughout Collin County. Um, as you're aware from this item, it, this will include some breaching tools that we have uh, planned for the, um, for the police department. And with that, any hard questions can go to Sam Greif at this hour. Sam, do you have a PowerPoint? <laughs> no, sir, I do not. Just, uh, <clears throat> You're my all right. favorite person. Any questions for Sam that apply to this actual item? Sam, you know how to Oh, you do. All right. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you. I'll open the public hearing. There are no speakers on this item. I will item. close the public hearing and confine the comments to the council. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to approve item two, please vote. Can Sam brief us in breaching technique? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> item three. <laughs> Just got to read it. All right. Well, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, did you want to read the item? Do you need to? No, you don't no worry. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. Consideration of a resolution to adopt the 2023 okay. legislative program for the City of Plano, directing the City Manager to act with regard to the City's 2023 legislative program and providing an effective date. Okay. Well, good evening, Mayor and Council. I'll be brief. Uh, my voice is going from allergies. I um, appreciate your time this evening. Andrew Fortune, Director of Policy and Government Relations. I have also with me a legislative analyst, Stephen Tanner. Um, a quick overview of our schedule for the upcoming 88th session. Um, we have, uh, uh, hopefully this month, either this meeting or next, uh, adoption of the 2023 legislative agenda. Um, bill filing will begin in November. Um, and so our goal is to target that before the bill filing um, commences so that we can really impact legislation before we, we have it introduced. Um, the legislature will convene in January. We do encourage you, if uh, schedule allows, to partake in the Plano days uh, with the chamber and the school district. That'll be in February, beginning of March. Um, and I've also included the deadline for bill filing in the last day of the session. So as you can see, the session moves very quickly. Um, and uh, as such, I just wanted to highlight and review uh, the process that you have established uh, for yourselves um, to have the legislative subcommittee um, with the mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Deputy Mayor Pro Tem uh, be the um, committee and body that I update on a regular, um, fast-moving basis. Um, and uh, we would be operating off of the legislative program, which is included in your packet. A brief overview um, and sort of preview to session. Um, as many of you have probably heard, we will be entering the next buy-in with a $27 billion surplus. Um, that actually will probably introduce more um, bills and more issues uh, than uh, a shortage would. Um, with that, we anticipate property taxes to be addressed, uh, school safety, mental health 
a, a plethora of items there, but we won't really know until after November. So this is just a, a preview of what's been discussed. Uh, several of you were at the TML conference and were able to hear these in more depth, and I'm happy to visit with you, uh, any of you offline, um, if you have more questions on that. Uh, the legislative program overview, uh, really we left the document that you used from last session largely intact because it was a great general overview that provided us maximum flexibility uh, to respond to these issues. As you know, uh, from last session we thought we were going into a session with specific issues and then we had COVID and we had a winter storm and several issues with the power grid that then caused us to be, have to pivot. Um, but our, Predominantly, we'll be looking to preserve our home rule authority. And really, the message that I've been communicating to our delegation and the business community and others is Plano is the example of what a city can do when it, it does things right. Um, and we'd like to preserve the tools that we are currently using responsibly, as evidenced by our bond rating and our excellence, uh, and, and really all of the programs that citizens uh, rely on and expect from us now. Um, several issues, of course, surrounding transportation infrastructure, utilities. The Public Utilities Commission is set to sunset. Um, we are working closely with our steering committee on, uh, on with Encore and the other uh, utilities to submit comments, and so we'll be going over that as well. Um, and then finally, I just want to highlight our partnerships, North Texas Commission, TML, of course, but also visit Plano, um, Plano ISD, and the Plano Chamber. We plan to be in lockstep, um, and we are a unique community in that way, as you already know. Um, when we look at things uh, like recapture that will be led by the school district, um, our goal is to maintain a city of excellence across all sectors. And however we can support our partners, and, and they have pledged to support us, we're going to do that. So with that, I'm happy to answer questions or uh, receive any feedback on the program. Mayor and Council, I'd like to add two quick things. Councilman Riccadelli and I had a, a few exchanges today with regard to our legislative program and efforts. And Andrew will be uh, our main person uh, traveling back and forth with Austin and really uh, working with Stephen to make sure that we're represented well in, in Austin. The city does not uh, have a paid lobbyist for the city. However, we do contract with the firm to do bill tracking, um, committee tracking, and do bill analysis. And so for us, it's kind of a unique, um, a unique position for us to take we feel that advocacy is best provided by our staff and, and our council, and that's something that we've we've committed to. We're staying true to that with this uh, this current approach. We wanted to make sure that that was on the record for our community to understand. So just wanted to pass that along. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. All right. Item four. Oh, it is a resolution. a resolution. Oh, my apologies. Okay. Can I get a motion? Motion to pass the resolution as presented. Yeah. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to pass the resolution to adopt the 2023 legislative program or agenda item number three. Please vote. <laughs> motion passes eight to zero. Last item. Item number four, consideration of a resolution to affirm the appointment of a shared board member with the City of Farmers Branch to serve on the Dallas Area Rapid Transit Authority Board of Directors to fill the unexpired term of office vacated by Glenn Callison ending June 30th, 2024, as provided in Chapter 452 of the Texas Transportation Code and providing an effective date. Mayor and Council, as you know, uh, our representative, Glenn Callison, has asked for a replacement due to uh, several conflicts that have arisen since his appointment. And so before you is an item to replace uh, Mr. Callison um, and to, to bring forward a, an interim to fill out the, the rest of the term. So, correct. Motion to approve. Oh, it's Nathan Barbera. Sorry, I forgot the <laughs> name. <laughs> Nathan and, it's Na the and it's Nathan Barbera. <laughs> second the motion. All right, I got a motion and a second uh, to uh, approve the resolution to affirm the appointment of a shared board member. Or agenda item four. Please vote. You did? All right, motion passes eight to zero. There being no further business, the meeting is adjourned.